Thank you also.
the originating application in TOJ number one of 2021 between Rock Hard Distribution Limited, Rock Hard Distributors Limited, Motilal Ramhit and Sons Contracting Limited, and the State of Trinidad and Tobago, the Caribbean Community, and the State of Belize and Trinidad Cement Limited. The panel for today's sitting comprised the honours, Mr. Justice Witt, presiding judge. Good morning, counsel. Mr. Justice Anderson. Good morning, counsel. Madam Justice Rajnotli. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Justice Barrow. Good morning, colleagues. And Mr. Justice Jamada. Good morning, everyone. May we have the appearances, please? Thank you. Your Honours, may it please you, Mr. Ian Benjamin leads Mr. Jagdev Singh, myself, and Ms. Karina Singh for the claimants. We are instructed by Ms. Nalini Jagnarain. Your Honour, should it please you, Mrs. Deborah Peak leads me, Tamara Tulsi, for the first defendant, the State of Trinidad and Tobago. We are instructed by Mr. Brent James and Ms. Radha Sukdev. May it please your honors, I am Dr. Corlita Bab Schiffer, and I appear on behalf of the Caribbean community with O'Neill Francis. Good morning, my name is Samantha Matu Tucker, and I am led by the Honorable Senior Counsel, Mr. Eamon Courtney, and we represent the state of Belize. Your honors, if I may, um, the minister is unable to be with us this morning as he has cabinet and his presence is required at cabinet this morning. So I do extend his apologies to everyone and to the court for his absence this morning. Good morning, Rennie Williams, Senior Crown Counsel, watching brief for the government of St. Lucia. Good morning, Your Honor. Should it please you, Mr. John Jeremy, Senior Counsel, leads me, Rafael Ajodia on behalf of the second intervener, Trinidad Cement Limited. Your Honor, as a representative of TCL, Ms. Michelle Davidson, company secretary, is on the link with us as well. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, uh, on this day, we will hear the oral submissions. Um, after having heard evidence yesterday, um, I have to stress that uh, you have limited time, although Mr. Benjamin has 75 minutes. Uh, you all know your time lots. The principle is nowadays, speak less, say more. And um, that is what we hope you will be able to do to get us smoothly through this day. May I uh, ask Mr. Benjamin to address the court? Deeply obliged, Your Honours. Good morning and thank you. Uh, Your Honours, what I, I hope to do in these uh, brief oral submissions that I have prepared is to provide you with assistance, bearing in mind that the claimants have filed uh, extensive written submissions, both in answer and in reply, um, in which we trust that we have dealt with the uh, issues of fact and law that arose before the emergence of further evidence by way of cross-examination yesterday. So what I propose to do is to bear that in mind, to invite your attention to those relevant paragraphs and to try to be as succinct as I am able so, so as to provide that assistance. So respectfully, yes. I'm sorry, Yes, you, you can. Yes, sorry. Respectfully, <laughs> these are the claimants of further oral submissions on the evidence and law in support of their originating application filed on the 24th of February. Um, by that originating application, the parties invoke the relevant articles under the revised treaty as juridical persons of contracting parties in what I would describe as the asymmetrical judicial review challenge against a member state and CARICOM challenging a specific um, decision and processes of A, one of its organs, the Council for Trade and Economic Development, Cortez, and B, of course, the state of Trinidad and Tobago. In particular, the claimant's judicial review challenge 
is directed at Cortez's 51st meeting approval, permitting the state of Trinidad and Tobago's application dated the 13th of November 2020 to further suspend the common external tariff for a second consecutive year in order to impose a 50% duty um, <clears throat> upon um, other hydraulic cement immediately following the prior imposition of a 35% rate of duty. And we say respectfully, without any analysis of a the 35% duty measure upon the claimants as CARICOM uh, cement importers and distributors, and B, upon CARICOM cement consumers, and C, in breach of the claimants' business rights under the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. We respectfully remind the court that since its early decision in the Trinidad Cement Limited against the Caribbean community, reference number 2009, CCJ4, original jurisdiction, that's authority two at page 2938. I don't ask the court to turn it up. <clears throat> that this court has consistently held that decisions authorizing suspensions of the common external tariff are reviewable on the basis of their lawfulness. I respectfully invite your court's attention to a few excerpted paragraphs from that judgment. I start with paragraph 32, then I go to 38. This is for your note at 39, 40, and 41. 32. The revised Treaty of Chagaramas represented a transformation of the CARICOM single market and economy into a rule-based system, thus creating and accepting a regional system under the rule of law. Just pausing there, that is an important observation, bearing in mind the uh, spirited discussion that took place when Dr. Brown was giving her evidence. And no doubt the court will recall that Dr. Brown expressed the view, and I quote, that while uh, the rule of law um, is attractive to courts, that in the context of the WTO and its obligations, um, the correct analytical approach was transactional. And I, I will say something about that in a minute. <clears throat> paragraph 38. The necessary, this necessarily means, um, paragraph 38 from the, from the case, that the court has the power to scrutinize the acts of member states and the community to determine whether they are in accordance with the rule of law, which is a fundamental principle accepted by all the member states of the Caribbean community. It would be almost impossible to interpret the RTC and to apply it to concrete facts unless the power of judicial review was implicit in that mandate. It is the judgment of the court that the impugned decisions to authorize suspensions in this case are subject to the judicial review by the court. Paragraph 39 going on to 40. Only to a limited extent are uh, such assessments susceptible of legal analysis and normative assessment by the court. But should I pause, madam? No. Am I clear? I, I thought someone was not hearing me. No. I'm I'll hearing you very well. So no, thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> I'll begin again. Only to a limited extent are such assessments susceptible of legal analysis and normative assessment by the court. But equally, the community must be accountable. It must operate within the rule of law. It must not trample on rights accorded to private entities by the RTC. And unless an overriding public interest consideration so requires, or the possibility of the adoption of a change in policy by the community was reasonably foreseeable, it should not disappoint legitimate expectations that it has created. And then finally, paragraph 41. But applications for suspensions must be dealt with in a principled, procedurally appropriate manner. The occasion for suspension may only lawfully arise if one of the conditions laid out for it in the RTC is present, and suspension should not be sought 
or granted for improper purposes. Supposing so they're just pulling the threads together in light of my observation about uh, the rule of law on the one hand and uh, transactionality on the other. So the claimant's basis um, rooted in the case law, not just in this consultation case, but the classification decision, which I will come to, and what I will describe as the second consultation decision, is precisely that um, Cotted and the state of Trinidad and Tobago are to be held by this court to have operated within a, only within a principled, procedurally appropriate manner, and that any suspension which the court discerns or decides is for improper purposes, such as dealing with an allegation of currency manipulation to which the Turkish lira or an imputation of dumping ought to be struck down for improper purposes. So my, my lords or your honors, we say with respect that while the space within which contracting parties and their citizens um, engage, that it is quite critical to identify that in their relationship, i.e. in the relationship between the claimants on the one hand and the Caribbean community organs on the other and their own state as well, that those relationships cannot properly be analyzed as transactional. We say that in a contrast or to be contrasted within the domestic sphere to transactional engagements between private citizens or companies, consumers and the like, that's one in the domestic sphere, and similarly to be contrasted at, at the level of the international sphere where you have states interacting with each other in the context of their world trade organization and GATT obligations, and dare I say it, privileges in order to facilitate um, more trade in goods and services. So we are respectfully invite the court to conduct its analysis um, in, in light of those observations. Uh, Mr. Benjamin. My Lord. Thank Your you Honor. so much for the last point you made, because I was going to ask you a question on it. Are you um, conceding, and this is the question now, that the relationship between member states of the WTO is transactional and uh, does not necessarily conform to the rule of law in the way that we have it in CARICOM? Your Honor, I think that I don't think that I can properly concede that that is a comprehensive statement of the nature of their relationship. So can I say what I mean by that? Can I say that I accept the following descriptor as to their relationship? It is characterized by flexibility, but even being properly being so characterized uh, by flexibility and therefore not improperly described or analyzed as transactional, both the flexibility and the transactionality take place within a defined context. That defined context includes the specific language of the relevant articles of GATT, for instance, Article 2, which deals with the schedule of concessions, Article 28, which specifically provides for negotiation between the parties, and which in this case was, um, how should I say, sought to be advanced by Trinidad and Tobago in 2018, and Article 18, and Article 18, with, res uh, with respect, Your Honor, embodies what I consider to be properly described as the hybridity, the hybridity of the WTO regime. In other words, there are processes and there are rules that Article 18 allows for some flexibility 
within either Section A, Section B, or Section C, as we heard Dr. Brown um, opine yesterday. But there are also exclusions and restrictions. In particular, you will recall that uh, Dr. Brown and Mr. Nicely discussed paragraph 20. In other words, there are some things that cannot be negotiated, and therefore, within the scheme of the WTO, in this sense, they are not transactional. Further, I entirely accept that member states, as opposed to individuals, can or seek to arrive at mutually acceptable solutions to the trade challenges that they are facing, either before, during, or after a determination by any of the uh, panels, appellate uh, tribunals, or arbitration bodies that are provided for by Article 23. Thank, thank you, Mr. Benjamin. Um, just to follow up, though, um, you, you mentioned three very important concepts, I thought, among many others, of course. Flexibility, transactionality, and did you say hybridity as well? Yes. Yes. Would, would those concepts, in your view, um, senior counsel, um, include a, a reference to, let us say, the 1979 decision to which Dr. Brown alluded yesterday, or the Doha Round decision? Would, would those uh, supplementary decisions take on in pursuance of the GATT WTO be of assistance in defining, understanding the space that you referred us to earlier? Respectfully, absolutely. So I say with respect that those further manifestations of what I might call the WTO landscape reflect all three of the characteristics or descriptors that I have advanced. Of course, I am bound to say, um, as um, Mr. Nicely um, testified to the court yesterday, that two things. One is that they, are, they have not been invoked. Two, they can only be invoked by one state to another um, in the context of, of a dispute. And three, they are not available to the claimants in this uh, case. And it's, it's helpful I, as well to just remind ourselves that the bottom line, if I can put it like that, the bottom line of the evidence as it emerged from Mr. Nicely and Dr. Brown was that Trinidad and Tobago's WTO bound rate in respect of other hydraulic cement as at at, a, at the latest April 2021 remain unchanged. The significance, respectfully, of the date is that this court is being asked to answer a question or a series of questions that arise and crystallize in November of 2020. So that using April as a starting point and looking backwards in the calendar, there is no dispute. As I heard the evidence, it may be that your honors take a different view. I am drawing an inference from the evidence. There was no, there was no dispute between the respective experts that the status of Trinidad and Tobago's WTO bound rate in respect of other hydraulic cement at the time that Cotted was making its deliberations and came to its decision at the very end of November 2020 that it was fixed at 5%. Thank you. I'm sorry for diverting you from the rule of law. <laughs> Not at all, Your Honours. I, I, I don't regard it as a diversion. I thought it was, if I may say so with respect, a, a helpful reminder. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions. Um, 
So, Your Honours, I was closing off by just making some observations. Um, generally, the grounds of judicial review. That's one. What that's what I was doing. And secondly, in answer to in answer to my uh, to Your Honours, if I may say so, helpful intervention. Um, I was setting the ground in relation to the WTO question in a way that respectfully I want to submit is, um, or ought to be, that's what I invite the court to say, ought to be uncontroversial. Can I now say something about the, uh, with the first question in a sense, the, the, the controversial question? So the controversial question uh, arises in relation to what my learned friends on the other side have sought to characterize as a question of jurisdiction. So I say firstly, with respect, that if your honors accept the following two propositions, no question of jurisdiction can or should arise. So proposition one would be whether or not uh, the, the bound rate is a fact of which Cotted could take notice at the date or the time of its deliberation. In other words, simply the existence of that fact, and it does not matter whether one describes it as an evidential fact or a legal fact, it matters not. And then secondly, I say that the other consideration which makes the question of jurisdiction uncontroversial is the simple question as to whether or not Cotted could properly have had regard to it. And so so, so I, I put that no higher. Could Cotel have had regard to the uh, state or the status of Trinidad and Tobago's WTO bound rate? And I say that the answer to that question is yes. And one of the consequences of the answer to both the second and the prior question is that no controversial um, question as to jurisdiction of this court arises. I do accept that my learned friends have sought to advance arguments to the effect that the, this court ought not to make any adjudication or determination as to whether or not, and I'm putting this quite deliberately, as to whether or not Trinidad and Tobago in the process of dealing with its WTO bound rate acted inconsistently or incompatibly or in breach of um, its WTO obligations and specifically um, Article 18, Section C. Now, your honors will recall that we have uh, dealt with those questions in outline and simply giving you the paragraph references in our written submissions at paragraphs uh, 27 to 30 to be found at page 2846. And your honors will recall, I don't know if you want to look at it with me. Um, your honors will recall that we say that no question of jurisdiction arises. Um, you will see how I put in the paragraph 27. No question arises uh, in this case on the ground that the claimants have raised the first defendant's failure to modify lawfully or effectively its bound rate. So I say that's consistent with the first way that I put it. Secondly, you see at paragraph 28 that we say we don't seek any relief that can properly be given by the WTO dispute or appellate body. And we say that in substance, all of the points taken as to jurisdiction are really questions um, as to <clears throat> what, how the court should exercise its, its power. And then the paragraph 29 and 30, we deal specifically um, with what we understood Dr. Brown to have articulated in relation to the dispute resolution process in her report. Um, from which I do not think, I think it's fair to say she did not depart when she gave her oral evidence yesterday. So, um, and, and your honors can see quite, quite clearly what our argument is there. We reject, as you can see in paragraph 29, that um, the, the assertion made by Dr. Brown 
um, it's in quotation marks, it's on line four, paragraph 29, it would be improper for members of the WTO to establish an organization with the authority to make determinations that are reserved for the multilateral trading system under the DSU. And you, you, you will see later on that Mr. Nicely, and we agree and we rely upon it, that Article 23 of the DSU doesn't arise in this case, which I do not think is in dispute in any event. Over the page of paragraph 30, to the extent that Dr. Brown is suggesting or arguing that no adjudicative body other than the panels can opine on the measures in compatibility, we say that the position is untenable. And we go on to say that domestic judicial jurisdiction ju authorities um, to suggest that they would violate, violate Article 23 if called upon to determine legislative or executive action as to whether it's consistent with WTO agreements is untenable. We also point out that Dr. Brown states else later on that the question, and I'm quoting now from line seven, the question of whether the agreements could be given direct effect has been left to the internal constitutional principles of a member's legal system. And I pray in aid the conversation that took place, if I can describe it as such, between Dr. Brown on the one hand and Mr. Nicely on the other, where, again, as I record the evidence as it emerged, it was common ground that states, that is to say, sovereign states, whether acting in their legislative or executive, and where appropriate, their judicial capacities, as a matter of WTO bread and butter, express an opinion as to whether something is, or an action rather, is or is not compatible with WTO obligations, including Article 18, as well as, well as uh, the ministerial declaration from Doha of 2001, and the other WTO procedures identified by Dr. Brown in the course of her oral evidence. Before we go too much further, um, Mr. Benjamin, um, could you help me in, in this way? Um, you, you do say that uh, quoted yes. ought to have regard yes. to the, the bound rate of Trinidad and Tobago in his schedule. Are yes. you going to elaborate on what you mean by have regard to that bound rate? Yes, yes. Okay, um, yes. so at, at that point, I'll be very keen to, to hear what you have to say about that. And perhaps you could also uh, indicate for us whether in your view, quoted ought to have regard as well to the hybridity, flexibility, and transactionality that characterizes the WTO arrangements. Yes. So thank you. I'll just make a little note of those two. And can I get to that in just one more minute, if, if, if it pleases your honor? Um, yes. in, relation to, in relation to the jurisdictional question, can I simply um, uh, refresh your honor's uh, recollection that in our reply submissions as well, um, we also identify certain uh, cases which we think would be of some assistance on the jurisdiction point. These are to be found in our reply submissions filed on the 4th of June, 2021, paragraphs 6 to 9 at pages 5994 to 5996. And, and, and that's for your note. Because I know your honors have read them, can I simply give you a, a flavor in re relation to one? So I am looking at paragraph seven. Um, this is an extract from authority um, 24 of, of our bundle of authorities. It's the International Food Company decision. And I would like, if I may, to pick it up um, from the middle of paragraph 19 on page 5994, where after having made reference to certain uh, judgments, the court said, nevertheless, it cannot be inferred from those judgments that citizens may not, in proceedings before the court, rely on the provisions of GATT in order to obtain a ruling on whether conduct criticized in a complaint lodged under Article 3 constitutes an illicit commercial practice within the meaning of that regulation. 
the GATT provisions form part of the rules of international law to which Article 2.1 of that regulation refers, as is borne out by the second and fourth recitals. And the, the court goes on to say, um, at the bottom of paragraph 21, the mere fact that contracting parties have established a special institutional framework for consultations and negotiations, pausing there, an illustration of what I have described as the hybridity of WTO. <clears throat> it, uh, the mere fact that the contracting parties have established a special institution as institutional framework for consultations and negotiations into say in relation to the implementation of the agreement is not in, in itself sufficient to exclude all judicial application of that agreement. So we say in reliance upon um, the citations that we have set out at paragraphs um, six to nine, of which I've merely given you a flavor, that as far as the juridical question is concerned, we invite the court um, to say that when it comes to consider, analyze, and assess on its consistent and well-established judicial review principles as to whether Cortez was entitled or is entitled properly to have regard to the uh, status of the WTO bound rate of Trinidad and Tobago and Trinidad and Tobago's actions there under that there is no exclusion by way of jurisdiction. Would you concede though that the European uh, experience might be a little different from ours in the Caribbean? Oh, uh, absolutely, Your Honours. I would entirely accept that the European uh, experience precisely because the EU is um, a juridical entity which is a party to the WTO, that makes it a distinguishing characteristic. It does not, however, deprive the uh, analysis and the considerations of the courts of utility or analogous application. Uh, we respect, I respectfully submit that in some respect, in many respects, but at least in one respect, the position before the Caribbean Court of Justice on the part of claimant juridical parties is more advantageous than that which um, exists before um, the EU bodies. Yes, and there is a provision in the revised treaty which requires us to apply international law that in, is in correct, a kind of general Your sense. Yeah. Yes, so that comment is an, as an important starting point to the, the following propositions that I derive from Your Honor's um, decision in the classification matter. And so this is an answer, Your Honor, to, to your two questions. Can Cotted have regard to the bound rate? And ought, ought this court, in expressing an opinion one way or another, um, also have regard and co should Cotted have regard to what we have been describing as um, hybridity? With respect, so, I don't wish for you to misunderstand my question. It wasn't that at all. I was seeking to find out from you what, in your view, you mean by having regard to um, Trinidad's obligations under the WTO. In other words, um, does it mean that because Trinidad has a bound rate of, um, is it 5%? Uh, that, yes. that having regard to that means that in no circumstance at all, can quoted uh, permit the increase of the CT above 5%. That, does that, is that the sense in which you are using having regard to? That's what I'm trying to get from you. Yes, so, so, Your Honor, I understand. Your Honor, can I just, I just have a moment? One sure. Honours, our respectful submission is as follows. 
we say that a cotted ought always to have regard to the status of a CARICOM member's bound rate in respect of any product or commodity whereby an application for suspension or alteration of the CET arises. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Benjamin. I thought you were going to be more helpful than that. Unless you have not finished. No, no, no. Post. Sorry, that was <laughs> that was statement number one. <laughs> ah, okay. <good. laughs> sorry. <Thank you. laughs> <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> statement number two. <laughs> Given the hybrid nature of a WTO member's obligations courted ought further to have regard and to be informed by the state a as to the status of the bound rate b as to steps that it is proposing to take and see any response from either the WTO and or how do I put this neutrally? An interested party. I was tempted to say an impugned party, but I, but I think more neutrally an interested party. Could you could you repeat these oh. three elements again? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll try. I, I hope that my junior has a note of it. Um, I was suggesting that Cotet ought properly to have regard to A, the status of the bound rate in relation to any specific commodity. In brackets, to have done so would be to act entirely consistently with Article 83. And of course, I'm going to come to the proper interpretation of Article 83. But a summary statement is this. Article 83 is a commodity specific or product specific or industry specific provision. Secondly, I said, I hope, that the proposals, the proposals. quartet ought properly to have regard to the proposals or actions or steps taken by the WTO slash member, CARICOM member state in respect of its boundary. In other words, just by way of illustration, has it issued a modification, a notification? That's one illustration. Has it engaged? in negotiations, that's a second illustration, has it triggered um, the application of a specific article or ministerial decision or other WTO response or mechanism? The ones that we've been discussing already. Three. Yeah. And thirdly, the third one, your honors, is what is what response has there been from a or other interested parties so that to answer your question your honor um judge anderson whether or not quoted determines that in the circumstances there could not be or they would not be in a position to approve a suspension of the CET would depend upon the responses, and of course I'm speaking in general terms, to those three propositions. In some circumstances, they would be able to say definitively and without hesitation, they cannot approve. 
That's one response. In other circumstances, they would be able to say definitively and without hesitation, approved. And in a third set of circumstances, as has happened from time to time, with applications such as this before Cotter, they would be able to say, you need to come back. We need an opportunity to consider, you need to update us, you need to provide us with further information. Yeah. So, so, so respectfully, I say, just in general terms, and of course, I think your honors can knows I, what I'm doing. Can, can, can I just, just interrupt you for one short moment? Is that all right? Or do you want yes, your honor, sorry, I, I didn't see who, who was speaking. Yes, your honor, Justice Javada, thank you. No, I just want to clarify, um, these are uh, points that you are making to the process that quoted as governed by a CARICOM rule of law regime should abide by if its decision was to be considered intravirus, the RTC, right? Yes, Your Honor. And, and, and you have, therefore, broken it into first A and then B with three sub parts. Yes, Your Honor. Right. So I, I'm raising that because if there are, because of the first thing that I framed, if there are any other, you've done A, B, and B, one, two, three. Yeah? Yes, Your Honor. If there are any other, is there a CDE under this um, heading? I, I, I would appreciate if we can get those, even if in line form at this point. In other words, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. What I understand you to be saying is that in your submission on this, a quoted decision that is CARICOM rule of law compliant and intravirus its duties yes. must a have regard to the state of the CARICOM members boundary b i'm not going to repeat it one yes. two three yes is that it or are there other things that you intend to add that are necessary for quoted to make an intravirus CARICOM rule of law decision but, Your Honor, I'm not entirely uh, clear what, what you might have in mind. Of course, I say respectfully that in order for Cotted to arrive at a compliant um, decision, it must have proper regard to a sensible reading and interpretation in good faith of Article 83. In addition, then, so that's C. Yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So that, 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 I'm not trying to. I'm just trying to understand what. So that we've done A, B, B, one, two, three. Is it that C is now quoted also must have a good faith, sensible reading of Article 83? Yes, John. Yes. Right, so, yes. <clears throat> okay. Now, so. Um, Let's 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 take the the most uh, the clearest form. Uh, let's say there is a, a bound rate in this case of five percent, and the member state tells quoted, "Yes, my bound rate in WTO is five percent. I have done nothing about it. It's none of your business." Now you are saying it is quoted's business. So what are the reasonings underlying that premise? On what is it based? Because this is the clearest form. We are not there in this particular case, but uh, take it as a, 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 a as a, the clearest form. There is a bound rate. Uh, the member state uh, wants to raise its it's uh, it uh, wants to have a suspension of the CET to bring up its import duty to a much higher level than the bound rate. Yes. It has done nothing about it. Yes. Uh, in your vision, then Cotet should say, as I understand it, uh, yes. we are not going to assist you in this. We are going to refuse uh, giving you a suspension of the CET. Uh, you are bound by your bound rate, and that's it. But 
on what yes. is that kind of decision based in law? Yes. So, so I, I say respectfully, it's based on the following three propositions. It is based on proposition one, a proper interpretation of Article 83, in the way that I have outlined a moment ago. But I want to give you advance notice. Your classification decisions says unequivocally have regard to international commitments, paragraphs 79 to 81. So that's one basis, the proper interpretation of Article 83 in the, in the way that I've sought to answer Justice Jamada. Secondly, I say it is consistent with the discharge of the obligation of good faith in international law. And I, of course, I have, if I may, well, I can say perhaps apologetically, extensive written submissions on that. And then thirdly, I say it is consistent with the discharge of the Article 26 obligation. And the Article 26 obligation, I, I would like to describe in the following way. And I'm just going to read it and then justify my, my answer. The Article 26 obligation is as follows. I'm only reading 26.1, and of course I know your honors know it. In order to enhance the decision-making process in the community, so pausing there, that sets out the objective, the council assisted by the Secretary General shall, in collaboration with competent authorities of the member states, establish and maintain. So those two elements are important. An efficient system of consultations at the national and regional levels. So that if you put that all together and ask the question as to whether in light A of the article, B, the interpretation of the article in what I have already described as the two consultation decisions. In other words, this is a driver towards transparency, efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, in, in, entirely consistent with the rule of law. I say with respect that those are the three bases, the bases in law, in international law, for this court to say that cottage should properly have regard to the WTO boundary. I go further and say that efficient consultations maintained, overseen, policed, if you like that word, by cotted require the member state in the discharge, in the good faith discharge of its Article 26 obligations to positively, and I'm sorry for spitting the infinitive, but I will do it again, to positively disclose to Cotted the matters that I've already identified in relation to the WTO boundary. So I say with respect that <clears throat> it is incumbent we say respectfully, upon the member state to put its cards face upwards on the table. Perhaps analogies are not helpful. But because, and this is the other side of the coin, it is the case, and I'm not going to dive into the facts just yet, it is the case that economic actors in order to make meaningful and efficient decisions about investment, business, commerce, and international trade, they need to know where they stand in the context of whatever applicable regime for duty applies to the goods with which they are concerned. Thank, thank you, Mr. I, I, may I say I found your uh, response to my question very helpful um, in at least indicating what you mean by having regard to yes, sir. Um, the bound rate. I thought it was very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, however, that has um, opened up other difficulties for me, I have to tell you. And I'm hoping you can be equally helpful um, to me in relation to those other difficulties. Um, one difficulty I have is that um, we have to be talking about the resources within CARICOM. 
yes. to be able to marshal the kind of information, make the kind of analysis of it that would be important to coming to their decision. And perhaps we'll hear from the general counsel later on about the makeup of quoted and whether in her view, right or wrong, um, we have that 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 resource. So that, that's one difficulty. Perhaps you can help me with that too. Yes, I will answer that. The, second, one, yes. the second difficulty I have though is, is that there seems to be a logical conundrum because you are saying on the one hand that there is the conceded feature of transactionality within the WTO system, which I think means that member states can agree, negotiate, and come to particular solutions to their trade problems. Whilst on the other hand, you are saying that a regional entity, i.e. quoted, yes. uh, should be able to, based on the information that one member state gives, make judgments about basically how successful the transactional negotiations will be, it seems. Um, maybe you're not saying that, but perhaps you get this chance to, to clarify. As Dr. Brown said, in many ways, the WTO uh, regime is a moving target. Things are moving, it's very dynamic. And uh, I'm not sure that a static decision-making body like quoted will be able to grasp the moving target, if you will, so as to be able to make the kind of decision that we are talking about. So those are my two difficulties. One, the question of resources within within quoted to be able to make the kind of informed analysis that you're inviting quoted to, to make. And then the, the second one is, is more conceptual, the idea of transactionality, meaning that the member states in the WTO can at any time, um, I assume, you know, call up each other over the phone or um, have other informal ways of dialoguing with each other, arrive at a solution which leaves the sort of static information encoded rather redundant. Perhaps you can help me or, or not, I'm not sure. Um, well, I will try. I mean, I have to entirely, um, so, so Your Honor, I will call with you only in one respect. Um, transactionality, um, please don't take me as of, 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 of having to um, be twisted or per, per, persuaded to, give, to make a concession. It is part of our argument to, uh, to identify and to agree nicely and Dr. Brown, Mr. Nicely and Dr. Brown, about the, we use a different word, flexibility. So we have no difficulty with transactionality and flexibility. That's the first thing. So it's it's not, it's not you're not extracting a concession from, from me. That doesn't change the obligation. So, but trans transactionality doesn't alter the obligation. So that's, that's, that's a reality. The other is, we have to be, and, and I'm, I'm really going to your third question. In other words, you posited a static institution against something that's more dynamic. The facts of this case, uncontroversial, are that something happened in 2018, something else happened in 2019, something did not happen in 2020, something did not happen in 2021, and so on. So that the timelines for this process, to the extent that um, this case is illustrative, or in fact, even the negotiations of the Uruguay round, or even the negotiations with Doha round are illustrative, suggests a much longer timeline. In other words, um, there, is a, there is a certain pace by which things at this level move. And therefore, although I resist the suggestion that a static institution is somehow um, less than, because with respect, I do not share Dr. Brown's pessimism. I'll put it like that. I do not share her pessimism about the fecundity of CARICOM institutions and CARICOM people. If, if, if I were to accept a criticism, professionally, I wouldn't go to the personal, if I were to accept a criticism, my, my, my posture is at the other end of the spectrum. In other words, it is always the case from my point of view that expectations um, are there to be met and they will not be disappointed. So I was responding to static. And so lastly, I want to say something about resources. I want to be clear what it is I'm not saying. I am not suggesting 
that what should emerge from Cortez's deliberations is a thesis or a paper written for a doctoral exam. We have seen the succinct capturing of decisions. And again, just by way of illustration, let's leave aside the facts in this case. And I would ask the court to, to, to recall to mind the Barbados decision, which was expressed in far more concise compass than the Trinidad decision. Because we can accept that there were discussions that took place at the end of November, which went on to other issues, uh, which were, if I might call it, peripheral to the core issue. So all that I'm saying, all I'm identifying is that there, I say with respect, a further call for resources is, or further resources would be unwarranted. I say that institutionally, and I've been struggling with how best to put what I'm about to say. Institutionally, it is the role of this court with respect, consistent with its jurisprudence, to ask CARICOM organs to do better than they have done today or tomorrow than they have done yesterday. I, I hope that, 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 that your honors are getting the gist of what it is I'm trying to articulate. And of course, I am not at any way, any way being disparaging or disrespectful, uh, because as you all know, Dr. Bam, um, is I have the highest regard for her personally and professionally, and the institutions that she represents. But institutions only grow, reform only happens when we call upon ourselves to do better. That, that's, that's in essence what I wanted to say in answer to my, your honor's questions. I don't know if that's of any assistance. Um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Could you help me here, uh, Mr. Benjamin? Sorry, Your Honor. I said, could you help me here with a small I will inquiry? try. I will try. I have, um, and it does no credit to the great, to, to the comprehensive nature of your presentation. So this is really my reducing something of a very sophisticated um, structure to a simple concept. But I get the sense that the thesis or the, 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 the principle of your presentation is that Quoted may refuse an approval because of bond rate implications. Would I be wrong in deriving that as one of the takeaways um, from your presentation? No, Your Honor, you have grasped my presentation correctly. I would add two words. And of course, it depends. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You have answered me very perfectly. Thank Deeply you. obliged, Your Honors. Um, Your Honors, I am very conscious that I've spent a lot of time on, I suppose, what might be a, a, an issue of some fascination. Can I close up on this issue and now invite your attention um, to, I think, in the time available to me, two further issues. Of course, I rely upon what it is I have said in my written submissions. So first of all, by, by way of closing. Sorry, so, Mr. Benjamin, Mr. Benjamin, you may take great comfort in terms of the remaining time yes. as your submissions um, have so far and the written submissions, both the opening and the reply, are very clear, very comprehensive, so you need not have any misgivings that we do not understand what you're saying. It is therefore simply a question of your emphasizing those things that you want to give emphasis to. But understanding is not um, a difficulty that you need to overcome. Yes, Your Honor, I'm deeply obliged. So can I say this on this question in relation to the evidence that we heard yesterday afternoon. So, Your Honours, respectfully, we say that the evidence that you heard from Dr. Brown and Mr. Nicely can be distilled um, to the following, which is to say, A, that uh, the bound rate is 5% at the time of the decision. B, all that Trinidad and Tobago has done pursuant to its 2019 notification is inconsistent with the clear language of paragraph 20 
section C, and C further, none of the additional um, matters, documents, or procedures identified by Dr. Brown have been initiated um, or put in play in any way, shape, or form. So in one sense, in that sense, I should say, in that sense, they are, to use Mr. Nicely's words, not relevant. They never came up. They are not in play. They have not been mentioned. There is no evidence from Trinidad and Tobago that suggests otherwise. Mr. Benjamin, can I ask this question then? What then is the position as far as the WTO is concerned as to Trinidad and Tobago's notification? What is that formal position? and What did we get from that evidence yesterday? From, from that evidence yesterday, we got, we got that nothing has happened. Nothing has happened. And, and, and I want to say, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, the evidence that Mr. Nicely annexed to his report identified that that decision um, went on to an agenda for the relevant committee fairly late in the day, and it was noted. It was noted, what, but it didn't change anything. That is correct. That is correct. And so that, the, so that if you are to make an assumption about the conduct of Trinidad and Tobago, it is that it has not done anything. Because if it had, it would have told us. So that's, that's a factual position. It has not done anything post November of 2019. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. So the status is not that it is, and I don't mean to be crude, a dead in the water, but it is awaiting revival by the state of Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago must do something. Now, Trinidad and Tobago cannot seek, because I, I cannot seek from the WTO as it were, some sort of advisory opinion, Article 23 is very clear. It's about disputes. It is about disputes. And it is, it is, it is questionable, respectfully, whether there is a dispute at all based on the material that is before the court. So, Your Honor, what I'm doing is I'm segueing into the question that I, I understood you to be asking yesterday, where Your Honor, Madam Justice Rajnathalee, raised the possibility or the specter of conflicting decisions. Well, in order for there to be a conflict between anything that this court might decide on the one hand which over the next couple of weeks, and another possible decision, and I'm not going to say anything about a timeline, it would require a party other than Trinidad and Tobago to make it an issue. And with respect, the possibility on the evidence before the court is entirely theoretical. There is no practical basis in the evidence for surmising or speculating that such a dispute um, could arise at any time at all. So I want to be careful about timelines, because I, I, I'm not purporting to predict the future. But, con but consistent with that is the timeline that is applicable to this process, because I did say I wanted to talk a little bit about Article 83. I don't seem to be able to get there. What is it critical on the, on the processes that have been initiated by Trinidad and Tobago is that they have a life of 365 days. So every day that one, in other words, of course your honor understands exactly what I mean. You make an application with respect, scandalously, from the point of view of a claimant business in November, or you make, yes, you make an application in November, a decision is taken four and a half weeks before the end of the year, let's leave out Christmas, Boxing Day, and New Year's Day and all the rest of it. And businesses are meant to pivot or to adjust or adapt. So we say, of course, 
and my, your Honor, this is in my written submission, that not consistent with transparency and predictability and who to be. But, but it's important for the purpose of this part of the conversation, Your Honor, to, to appreciate that it's a finite period of time that this, kind, this particular decision or, and the decision that preceded last year operates on. I, I, I take it, Mr. Mr. Benjamin, that we would understand the implications of what you're saying for um, impact on the business, the private sector. Yeah. Um, and I think that point is not lost. But to go back to the question my sister raised with you, yeah. in terms of the, the status of um, Trinidad and Tobago's taking certain actions in the WTO, Yes. And what is the legal effect of that? Would you concede that um, there are differences of opinion? Because I seem to recall one of the experts yesterday saying that once Trinidad and Tobago had taken the step, it's recorded in the agenda, yes. um, then it can go forward um, yes. with its proposed um, action. And it's only if another member state were to then raise an objection, then we could, we could get into a difficulty. So all, all I'm asking from you is, would you concede then that the point is um, uh, un undecided as to what the status of Trinidad's um, um, measures would be in a circumstance where it has, in fact, taken those steps in the WTO? So, Your Honor, respectfully, uh, I would say the status is not in doubt. What, what action may be taken at some stage or at any stage, today, tomorrow, next week, next year, um, that is open to speculation. I understood Dr. Brown, for instance, to be saying that they, they could alter something, that they could engage in these conversations, that they could, that they could trigger a process. All, all of that I am not disputing. All that I am saying to the court is that there is no evidence that Trinidad and Tobago is even inclined to adopt any one, or in fact, all of the alternative um, regimes that Dr. Brown was, again, with great um, imagination and rapidity, uh, providing to the court yesterday. So, uh, so Mr. that- Mr. Benjamin, just, just yes, to stick a pin there. Was yes. that, am I mistaken then that Dr. Brown was saying that, that, that the, not that the status remained unchanged, but the notification stood? until yes. someone else disputed it. But well, is that yes. so? Yes, yes. Is that is so? That is so. So, but the question buried in that statement, Your Honor, is well, what is the effect of the notification? That is, that is, that is so. <laughs> and correct. And so respectfully, the, the notification has no effect because WTO has had no effect as far as WTO is concerned. This is not counsel saying this is what it means. If this is residing in the bosom of the WTO. The WTO has said the bound rate is 5%. So that whatever you wish to do, it's not a question of withdrawing or qualifying or amending the notice. It is up to you, Trinidad and Tobago, to do something. And perhaps I could go even further to say to do anything. One of the options that it has exercised is the option to do nothing. And therefore, the status doesn't change because we know what the status is, and the parties were the the sorry, the experts rather were agreed in relation to that. Didn't uh, did not the uh, permanent secretary give evidence yesterday where she was asked what is the bound rate, and she answered first she answered there is a notification, but when pressed, she said the bound rate is 5%, isn't that yes. what she said? Yes, Your Honor, Your Honor remembers the evidence um, completely accurately. So that means the bound rate has not changed. That is correct, Your Honor. That is correct, Your Honor. That's respectfully how we, how we see it. Uh, we, see, we see that's what the evidence discloses. Perhaps my friends will say something else in, in due course. Yes. <clears throat> Your Honours, I, I just wanted to make uh, this brief observation in the time that's remaining to me um, in relation to Article 83. I've already said it, I've given you a hint that Article 83, so this is to connect it to 
um, uh, my previous submissions, I, my respectful submission is that Article 83, and in particular Article 83, 3 is product, commodity, and industry specific. We have set out the terms of Article 83, you probably have it in a variety of, of, of locations, but we've set it out at paragraph 81 of our principal written submissions filed on the 14th of May, 2021. That is to be found at page 2863 if you find it convenient. If you find it convenient elsewhere, um, we have reproduced it, we hope faithfully. And so we say respectfully that if you read um, Article 83, all of the articles, because you should, but in particular Article 83, 3, A to H, that they are, with one exception, um, on their express, or put another way, literal words, product specific. I will still come to the exception in a minute. But the context, of course, is an alteration or suspension of the common external tariff. And I, I hope I can be forgiven for saying to this court what it already knows, because one must never teach, teach one grandma, one's grandmother how to cook. But this court knows from the, 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 the variety of jurisprudential statements that Article 83 is always about what is the common and external tariff on a particular good that is classified in a particular way. So that is the upshot of the classification decision. And therefore we say that A, B, and C, which use the words product, A, B, and C, which use the words product, that that context also applies to D, which does not use the word product at all. We say it applies to D, we say it applies to E, we say it is obvious that it applies to F and G because you're talking about um, uh, an industry in F, you're talking about a product um, in G, and you're talking about an item in H. So we say respectfully um, that the understanding, there has to be some connection, some connectivity causal relationship between what the applicant member country is seeking to do, that is product or industry specific, irrespective of any of the grounds um, that are, are being um, advanced. And we say that it is consistent A with a plain common sense reading of Article 83, and it is also consistent um, with its good faith interpretation out of the Vienna Convention. And thirdly, we, we rely upon, as I have already mentioned, the court's um, jurisprudence. In that context, there are, again, in the time left to me, actually, Your Honours, do I have, is it 15 minutes left? You're almost there, but uh, we have asked several questions, so yes. I can allow you on a five minutes extra. So, so Your Honours, there, there are two things that I think it's, it's important for me to say. Uh, the first is in relation to um, consultations as the evidence emerged uh, yesterday. So, so we say in respect of consultations and the, the allied issue as to what it is that Trinidad and Tobago relied upon, we say that what that first of all that there were there were no meaningful or engaged consultations i anticipate that the reports will be that we did not take advantage of the opportunity you already know what my answer to that is that i was fully entitled to say well at least help me understand what it is you are thinking about so that i can apply my mind to providing you with assistance and we were given no joy we were told there is no proposal, there is no consideration, there is no justification to you to be given, and um, we have issued a notification in relation to WTO bound rate. I, I won't say anything more about the last matter. Um, <clears throat> we say that that is not satisfactory, not good enough, but even if um, you are unpersuaded by that, we would ask the court to consider the evidence to be found in the correspondence in the context of what TCL clearly knew. TCL was clearly advancing to, not to the ministry, it's important, 
the letter that TCL wrote that I drew the permanent secretary's attention to yesterday, it wasn't just to the ministry. They were sharing with the ministry a discussion that they were engaged in with the TTMA. And that is what uh, the, the permanent secretary relied upon. And she felt able to say that, he, that it, it was not appropriate for that to be drawn to the claimant's attention. If we roll the clock forward and we get to the point where cabinet has been approached, in addition, at that point in time, the claimants were not informed. They're not told that an approach to Cotted is in the offing. When Cotted is approached, actually approached, they are not told that that has happened. When Cotted has made a decision, they are not told that that has happened. And you will recall yesterday that my little friend for the state of Trinidad and Tobago uh, criticized the claimants and drew to their attention, well, no one wrote to Cotted until December. Well, the reason why we were writing to Cotted in December of 2020 was to discover what had happened because we did not know and we were not told. Uh, we were not informed. So that Article 26, consultations and compliance goes beyond, it's not limited to the process that, that precedes the decision. There is a, we say, um, those processes of consultation must be engaged and they must be maintained. At no point in the consultation, at any, oh, if that's how it's to be properly described, were we given an opportunity to respond to two related allegations. One was that the Turkish lira currency was being manipulated, I think is, a, is, is the most um, deployed, perhaps it's a more neutral word, and that we were therefore, <clears throat> we therefore had an unfair advantage that is the language that is used. Unfair advantage is the language that is used in the application to Cotter. Unfair advantage is the language that is used in Cotter's decision. So this unfair advantage that we had, that was never put to us. And we say that it ought to have been properly put to us, that we were behaving in a way that could give rise to the suspicion, damaging to our reputation, that we as a commercial enterprise were engaging in um, improper, unfair practices, dumping, whatever. And you will recall, of course, that the uh, permanent secretary disavowed any anti-dumping investigation had been triggered by her ministry as the um, competent authority. So that those allegations were not put to us, but, but equally the allegation that over the period 2016 to 2020, that's in general terms, but specifically in 2020, that we were not earning our way in the world. That is my euphemism for earning foreign exchange. Because that is, that is what a country has to do. A country has to earn its way in the world. It has to sell either a good, a product, or a service that enables it to purchase the necessaries. A pressing example that you can all identify with is you have to have foreign currency to buy vaccines. Every country does. So the allegation against us is that we, as an economic actor, were consuming limited foreign exchange and we were not earning foreign exchange. And the evidence before the court to be found in the witness statement of Mr. Ramit, he identified exactly how we earned the US dollars that were necessary to pay for the product that emanated from Turkey. So that too is another allegation of improper um, an unfair behavior on our part uh, that we were never given an opportunity to, to, to answer. <clears throat> and then, so we say that any one of those omissions entitle this court either to set aside the decision that Cortez has arrived at or a remitter. So either to set aside or a remitter. And then finally, of course, all of this needs to be set 
or to be considered. Mr. Benjamin, oh, Mr. Benjamin, just before you move off of the consultation, and you may be coming to it only because of the facts that you have raised. Um, Your Honor, I'm sorry, could you repeat that last sentence? You faded. I said because of the facts that you have just uh, raised. Please. Yes. Jump in and right for right. Is there um, an applicable principle in this review? Because this is a review of a decision of Cotet, correct? Yes. Yes. Right. Is there an applicable principle in relation to um, irrelevant or immaterial considerations or prejudice? How do those do, do those juridic principles play out uh, in relation to the decision making authority? So, so Your Honor, respectfully, we say that if Cotter has regard to something that is prejudicial, as we say, all of these things are, but any one of them could be, we say that it has the following defects from a judicial review point of view. <clears throat> a, it is not consistent with the, cons the positive obligation of consultation, so it is contra to and in conflict with Article 26. B, it is not consistent with a common sense, robust interpretation of Article 83. C, it gives rise to the conclusion that the decision of Cotted is both is disproportionate, irrational, and driven by considerations of an improper purpose. So let me just explain that last one, just to connect the dots. To the extent that <clears throat> you are making a decision about the rate, about the level of the duty as a means of counteracting perceived unfair or anti-dumping type conduct or manipulative type conduct, then you are using Article 83 out with the established procedures for dealing with um, an entity that has had a suggestion made against it that it is guilty of dumping. So there is a regime that ought to be used. You cannot deploy another one for that improper purpose because it is irrational in the proper sense of the word um, and it is disproportionate. Following on from my, my brother Jamadar's um, question, um, I wanted to ask you about the, I think what you allege to be a failure to disclose the plans to impose a quota. And yes. in your litany of um, grounds on which quota's decision could have been impugned, you seem not to have mentioned that. How much weight do you put on that ground? Oh, sorry, Honor. I again, so the assumption I've been making in relation to quota is that it's in the written submissions, but I'm happy to say something it's, about it's it a now. Safe, it's a safe assumption that we are very familiar with. I'm just, I'm just asking you, how much weight do you propose to put on that particular ground as opposed to or contrasted with the others? So, so I would say that the reliance that the claimants the, or the degree of weight we place on the quota issue is quite substantial. It is quite substantial precisely because it is the evidence is clear. If only you use the letter dated the 18th of September 2020, that the state had it in its mind because at a minimum TCL mentioned it in. TCL put it in its mind as of September 2020. And I, of course, I mean the state's mind. I don't, you know, I don't mean the personal mind of the permanent secretary. I'm not criticizing her. But clearly it was a consideration. Announced on the 3rd of December. Secondly, when you roll the chronological clock forward, you have the inexplicable statement that the that the, the public announcement of the quota took place on the 3rd of December. So the quota is announced publicly before the claimants even know about the change in the duty. When was the announcement of the quota? Sorry. The 3rd of December. The 3rd of December. So that tells you what significance the state placed on it. Six days after quota. And fundamentally, it completely altered, as you know from the evidence of the case, it completely altered um, 
the, the landscape for us. So all the points that I made about chronological and time and a late notice to quota and not being told and so on, in relation to the quota, it is a card, if any of you play all fours, it is the jack that was put in the back pocket and dropped down on the table, but it is not, it is not appropriate, it's not fair. So in that, this is not transactional at all. This is definitely rule of law stuff. This was wrong, wrong, wrong. But of course, Mr. Benjamin, it is premised, and I, I'm trying to recall the evidence of the PS on this. Yes. It is premised on whether or not, because the quota decision was in November, wasn't it? Yes, the quota. So let me help you, my lord. The quota decision meetings took place over the 27th to the 30th of December. RHDL4. Okay. I can give you the reference. December? You oh, sorry, November. I, said, I, I misspoke. Right. 27th right. to the 30th of November. Agreed. So that if it is that yes. Trinidad and Tobago had no uh, intention at that time, and there is no evidence to suggest, I'm, I'm not saying there is, I'm saying, and yes. if there is no evidence to suggest otherwise, yes. then can we uh, criticize that not being brought to the attention of quoted in those November uh, deliberations? <clears throat> in other words, how are you? You see, you make the connection in September 2020 because TCL, you say, place it in the mind of the state. But of course, that is uh, a little bit speculative. It, 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 it sounds good, but how do you uh, yes. connect this right. to the state? Because of course, if you could show that before the end of November, yes. the state Forget about what TCL put in their mind. The state Agreed. was considering quota. Yes. Then your argument, I am assuming, would be that a material consideration within the knowledge of the member states slash um, the member state was not brought to the to the attention of quota, which may have had an impact on its decision making process. That's the argument yes. you want to run there. Yes, I, I get yes. that. Well, it's not. I say respectfully. It's. I don't think it, it crosses the line to ask so, us as a court to say that because CCL wrote it in a letter, it was in the mind of the state. Are you so not your asking Honor, us? Yeah. Yeah. So, so your your Honor, um, I, I can approach it two ways. I can put. I can tie one hand behind my back and leave aside it and pretend that the CCL letter is does not exist. In other words, conceptually, I'm not, I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm just saying conceptually, it is it is okay to do that. Um, so that the way that I invite the court to come to this conclusion is to look at the chronology. The quota was announced on the 3rd of December. In all, it's so sorry. Good. Somebody has a hand raised. Third, yes. Third of December. December. Third of December. In order for it to be announced in the third of December, as the permanent secretary told us yesterday, a decision had to have been made at the level of cabinet. So, cabinet has to meet. Ordinarily, they have the benefit of a cabinet note. She said it came from cabinet. But in any event, whether it came from cabinet or not, then there, that means there is a decision from cabinet. There is a cabinet minute. Ordinarily, cabinet minutes are confirmed at the following meeting. That's the ordinary course of how cabinet works, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but everywhere. Well, the, the Westminster style system. And then the decision, whether that is right or wrong, then the decision has to be given in being put into effect. It has to be operationalized. So that at a minimum, it can only be published in the newspapers, because that is where we found out about it on the 3rd of January, or 3rd of December. Keep on getting my dates confused. If that decision had been communicated to the press at, at a minimum the day before. 
So it's not possible to communicate it to the press on the third and it be published on the third, on the morning of the third. It must pause. have been. So pause. This yes. decision was gazetted or published? No, this published. It, was, it was published in the newspaper. In other words, an app, the importers and distributors were invited to um, make applications and they were asked to contact. And they were asked to contact the ministry. So that what can my you, Lord is can, asking can, about, can, about a gazette. Mr. Benjamin, can you give me the day of the week? Um, I used to know it. Um, I'm going to ask one of the juniors to tell you in a second. So just bear with me. What does he want to know? The day of the week for the 3rd of December. But can I, while I'm, while they're looking, can I answer the other question? You, my Lord, sorry, Your Honor, asked a pertinent question about gazetting. And that is to be found in our originating application. It was gazetted pursuant to legal notice. Um, legal notice, uh, I think it's 417 of 2020, and I'll give you the reference to that. So to answer my Lord's question, Your Honor's question, I'm so sorry, Your Honor, the 3rd of December is a Thursday. The 3rd of December is a Thursday. The 30th of November is a Monday. The 27th of November is a is the previous Thursday. I'm just going to double check that. Because I don't trust my yes. The 27th of November is the Friday before. So Cotted met over the weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Sorry. I, I don't know. Can I just intervene to correct my learned friend? The undisputed evidence is that the meeting of Cotted was the 26th and the 27th of November. It did not extend to the weekend, as my learned friend is suggesting. I'm happy to be corrected. I'm, I'm very grateful for my learned friend in setting me straight. The notice is RD, RHDL 10. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, s
and paragraphs 83, 91, and 93, and Mr. Maloney's affidavit, paragraphs 18 to 21, and paragraph 34C. That's, that's A. B, a decrease in the cost of construction. Right? So these were these are things of which CARICOM was deprived. Paragraph 24 and 25. I'm sorry, Mr. Benjamin. Uh, I'm sorry, but are you referring to materials that we have before us? Yes, yes. But with greatest of respect, I think we have them before us, so there's no need. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think the president did indicate that, I'm sorry, your time has long um, expired, so. Yes, Your Honor, well, I was, I'm, I'm happy to pause here. I was going to make, uh, I, I'll stop. I was, I was seeking to just simply draw your attention to, to the impact. It's in the evidence. It hasn't been drawn together, um, but um, I, I'm content. As my brother, to Justice Barra said, you don't have a problem with our understanding. We understand you perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> I'm deeply obliged, Your Honor. Your Honours, um, those are my respectful all the submissions. Of course, I rely on everything that we put in writing. Um, uh, unless I can assist you further, um, that's what I'd like to say. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Benjamin. I think um, although we are uh, running out of time, I think it is an appropriate moment to just have a five minute break. Um, and then Ms. Peek will uh, be able to speak. I think I saw some speaking notes passing by from Dr. Bob Schaefer, from which I got the impression that she might not need a full 60 minute. Is that correct, Dr. Bob Schaefer? Your honors, I need the full 60 minutes. <laughs> that, uh, probably of because of what was said. So I, I, I'm not going to take anything away from you, 60 minutes, neither for, for Ms. Peek. So, but we still take a five minute break. I think that uh, will help us uh, to get through. So it's now 11.37. Uh, well, let's take it a quarter to, quarter to 12. And we can start. So I adjourn for, for a few minutes. We can we we resume quarter to twelve. Thank you.
judge, I'm not seeing Madam Justice Roach, not Lee. Is she, is she? Yes, not a senior yet. Are you seeing her? Are you seeing her, Justice Roach? No. Right, so we may. We... You're muted now, so. Thank you very much, Your Honours. Your Honours have the benefit of full written submissions from all of the parties, and we submit that the written submissions of CARICOM, Belize, and TCL are of considerable importance to the, or assistance to the court in filling any gaps in our submissions as the first defendant as we respectfully say that they emphasize areas and provide relevant authorities to assist the court. In our respectful submission, cumulatively, the submissions of the two defendants and the two interveners provide a complete and comprehensive answer to the various positions advanced by the claimants in their pleading and in their written and oral submissions. We start by reminding the court, and I think we know this is present to the minds of the members of the court, that this is a judicial review claim targeted principal, principally at the decision of an organ of CARICOM that is quoted, taken in November 2020 to authorize the suspension of the CT on other hydraulic cements for a one year period, 1st of January 2021 to the 31st of December 2021. An examination of the reliefs as amended by the claimants at the interlocutory stage, which is sought by the claimants at paragraph 122 of the originating application makes this clear. You will see that in their pleading, the claimants have also made allegations that the state of Trinidad and Tobago has engaged in what they call a pattern of conduct over the years to obstruct or extinguish the business interests of the claimants and to eliminate trade with Turkey. Now, in my learned friend's submissions today, you will see that he used the expression improper purpose as an avenue to raise other issues, which in our respectful submission is not supported by the pleading. It is very clear that the claimant's case in relation to its allegation of improper purpose is that the pattern of conduct that they alleged was designed to and or achieved the obstruction or extinguishment of the business interests of the claimants and was also intended to eliminate trade with Turkey. In our respectful submission, we don't need to say anything about that because those allegations were simply not established. So we don't propose to spend any time today on those allegations. The first question that we would, uh, we imagine the court is asking itself is what should it make of the Viva Voce evidence it heard yesterday? In our respectful submission, some things are clear. One, the claimants, two witnesses of fact, gave evidence inconsistent with each other on some pretty basic but fundamental issues, such as which of the claimant companies has imported rock hard cement into Trinidad and Tobago over the period 2016 to 2021, a matter we would imagine having regard to the series of claims brought before the courts would be pretty clear in the claimant's mind. It, is, it was boggling, mind boggling to us to hear the witness for the first claimant say that it was the import of cement into Trinidad and Tobago when all the documentation shows otherwise. And then the witness for the second and third claimants admitted freely that the importer was Mutilal Ramit and Sons Limited. So even in respect of something as fundamental as that, 
what reliance or weight should the court place upon the written evidence submitted by the claimants? The other area of grave uncertainty was this alleged take or pay contract that were found that featured in the witness statements of both Mr. Ramitz and Mr. Maloney. And the question was, does it exist for future imports of extra regional cement? Who are the parties to this contract and what are its provisions? All of that remained uncertain because if one witness said who were the parties, different from the other witness who said who were the parties, different from the written evidence of the claimants as to who the parties were, and so on and so on. What is clear, however, in this morass of evidence is that despite the 35% CT imposed in 2020 based on Cortez authorization, Imports of rockard cement into Trinidad and Tobago increased in 2020, and prices of cement on the local market either dropped by $1.33 per bag over the 2019 price, which is according to the state's data, or according to Mr. Ramit, who gave anecdotal evidence of this, he said the prices remain the same. Now, that's very important. And we will come next to the concessions that were made by Mr. Ramit as to what impact or lack of impact that had on the local manufacturer. Mr. Ramit accepted that on the evidence, the 35% rate of duty in 2020 had no impact on making imports of cement more expensive for the consumer. And that was clear on the evidence and that they did not offer any protection to the domestic manufacturer of TCL. So that is the undisputed evidence before the court. We submit that the court can have no confidence in relying on the claimant's evidence so far as matters relating to the first claimant's arrangements with Son Mez, the Turkish supplier, are concerned as the claimants have produced no documentary evidence to support SIEM as both of the witnesses are fact accepted under cross-examination. In fact, Mr. Maloney could not comment on many of the matters set out in Mr. Akbatur's letter, nor was he able to clarify or explain the inaccuracies and inconsistencies in the letter. In our respectful submission, little or no weight should be attached to the matters set out in Mr. Akbatur's letter, which have not been given under oath and which he has not come forward to explain. Mr. Nicely's evidence is that a manufacturer operating in a free zone such as Sonmez, required by Turkish law to export 85% of its production, may raise issues as to whether the cement produced there is fairly traded and or is WTO compliant. The second point that we would ask the, the court to conclude from the Viva Voce evidence is that on the issue as to the effect of the notification dated the 12th of November 2019, issued by the state of Trinidad and Tobago to the WTO under WTO law, we remind the court that this is in relation to this issue, we remind the court that this is not a claim which is the deciding, which it is deciding on the merits where it substitutes itself for the decision maker. This is a judicial review claim where the court is engaged in reviewing the process by which Cotet arrived at its decision. And in this regard, we ask the court to note that the claimant's case is not simply that Cotet was obliged to have regard to a member state's tariff binding, and that was made clear by Mr. Benjamin in his submissions a little while ago. But they go beyond that to contend that Cotet was obliged to determine whether the state of Trinidad and Tobago had lawfully or effectively modified its boundary at the WTO level. So far as the Viva Voce evidence is concerned, another thing that is very clear is that there is no agreement between the two experts on WTO law as to whether the notification issued by the state amounts to non-compliance or to use Mr. Nicely's language, a breach of GATT WTO. Dr. Brown's clear evidence, and I have to respectfully disagree with Mr. Benjamin's assessment of the evidence of the two experts, her clear evidence on Article 18 of GATT, supported, as she said, by the Safeguard Decision of 1979, 
and the Doha ministerial decision on implementation related issues and concerns mentioned by His Honor Justice Anderson, all of which form part and parcel of the WTO legal regime, is that where urgent measures are required, a developing nation member state such as Trinidad and Tobago may impose the measure immediately upon notification. That is the evidence of the expert Dr. Brown. Article 18 provides a route whereby a member state that is a developing country can issue the notification and implement the measure immediately following notification. As she stated, once you notify, you can implement. No member state has come back to Trinidad and Tobago and questioned or objected to what has been done in the WTO. In our respectful submission, these are salient facts and expert evidence which this court cannot ignore. So it is therefore wrong in our respectful submission for my learned friend to say that both experts agree that the bond rate remains at 5%. I think when Dr. Brown was asked to comment on that exhibit being a, a document issued by WTO, her comment was, it's not always, the records are not always updated on a timely basis. And in relation to the expert evidence, as the president correctly summarized the position after hearing them both, Mr. Speaker, can I just interrupt you for a minute? So, is it then just for this piece as a record? Is it then that your submission is based on Dr. Brown's evidence that the bound rate is, for the WTO jurisprudence, seventy percent? She did not say that in 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 those words. I think to to construe her evidence fairly, she says, where you have a bound rate, Article eighteen permits you to give your notification to WTO as to what you intend, what rate you intend to apply, and Article 18 authorizes the member state to implement as per the notification immediately. And what and can has follow... That, has, has, okay, so that the 83 is the notification and the 18 allows the implementation under Doha and the safeguard jurisprudence you spoke about, correct? But is that an automatic implementation or does something have to be done? Her evidence is that it is automatic. So it is automatic upon issuing the notification. It takes effect yeah, until right. a member state raises it. I think her language is once you notify, you can implement. Those were her words. Well, yes. So therefore, is it that once you notify, you can implement or is it that once you notify, it is, as you said earlier, automatically implemented, which is it? Because if it is the latter, then it means it is implemented because we know it was notified as a question of fact. As, as far as our understanding goes, immediately upon notification, it can be implemented and it was implemented in this case. Therefore, the boundary is 70%. Well, I don't want to say must, that. Oh, but, but not necessarily. Not, I mean, I don't want to speak to WTO law on which I am not an expert. And therefore, no, I no, don't no, think. No, 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 no. I'm not asking you to speak to WTO. I'm asking you to construe the evidence of the expert. I'm accepting that I'm not asking you to speak on WTO law. You are making a submission on the evidence of Dr. Brown. And yes. there is a difference between automatic upon notification automatic implementation and upon notification a member can implement there's a difference between those two so the first thing is what do you say the other evidence of dr brown says because you've used both you've said at one time automatic and you've said at other times can which do you say it is and depending on which you choose, I think there may be certain um, very logical inferences that follow. Well, Your Honor, I can only address you on the evidence that is before the court and the language used by Dr. Brown is 
it allows you to implement. That is the language that you used. Once you notify, you can implement. The court will have a better record of the evidence, but that is our record of it. And in our respectful submission, I don't know that there is a material difference between it is automatically amended upon the issuance of the notification or the notification constitutes authorization or authority to implement. I imagine it's a matter for the state as to what date it would actually uh, it will actually take effect from. But again, you know, this is an area and, and it emphasizes in our respectful submission why this is not an issue that should engage this court because there are just too many uncertainties. You know, we're not but comparing. Except, except, but except Mrs. Speak, the, the question is whether Trinidad and Tobago had a duty and or quoted had a duty Trinidad to inform and quoted to inquire about the boundary. Not, not, not the jurisprudence as to what it is. So, if, to my mind, as a reviewing agency, you are reviewing the decision-making process, as you rightly said. I think, I think we, we we are good with that. So, the, so the only question is whether or not quoted as a decision-making authority uh, sought and obtained information that is relevant. It may be that information about bound rate is not relevant at all. It may be, Mrs. Speak, that at the end of the day, Cotet had no duty or responsibility to inquire about bond rate, or Trinidad had no duty or responsibility to talk about it. But what I'm interested in is something slightly different, not so much maybe as to what is the bond rate, but whether or not, in your opinion, Cotet had a duty and a responsibility to inquire about it and consider it, and or Trinidad had a duty and a responsibility to disclose exactly what Dr. Brown may have said. That is to say, we notified and we implemented or not. Uh, I'm much obliged, Your Honor. In our respectful submission, those two issues are completely separate. In other words, what your, Lord, what your Honor has addressed is the anterior question, whether, uh, and I think several uh, of, of your Honors have raised it frontally, and I think uh, Justice Barrow raised it, you know, is it this notification that something that if you if you cannot persuade the the, the quoted that you have actually altered your bond rate will defeat an application for suspension? That in our respectful submission, that question can only be answered by construing and interpreting Article 83. In other words, and you will have seen it foreshadowed in the submissions of the state of Trinidad and Tobago, Belize and CARICOM. When member states decide to amend the treaty to say what are the matters that states can take into account, it would be wrong in our respectful submission for parties, not member states, or indeed respectfully the court to add in or read in additional uh, factors that they must consider. But my Lord, Your Honor, we will come to that. But you have asked okay. the specific question, which I think is a fair question. What is the, the result of the evidence we have heard as to what is the status of Trinidad and Tobago's bound rate? And I can only faithfully answer based on the evidence which is before you. We heard Mr. Nicely saying categorically, black and white, simple issue, the bound rate remains 5%. And Dr. Brown, you know, in a very mature approach to the issue says, this is not a black and white issue. It's not straightforward. It's wrong to just look at Article 2 and Article 18. You must look at the agreements and the understandings that form part and parcel of the WTO fabric. And in her uh, opinion, what the state did under Article 18 is perfectly permissible. And it takes effect or it can take effect upon notification. And Melinda Jr. refers me to a document that is before the court, which is RHDL 7 to the originating application, which is in fact the proposal, sorry, the confirmed decision of quoted taken at the 2019 meeting. And I will just read for you, it's page 172 of the record, what was said in response to the much muted, muted point about the Grenada representative's intervention. 
And this is what the representative of Trinidad and Tobago said. In response to the concern raised by the Grenada representative, the Trinidad and Tobago representative provided the meeting with an update on the engagement with the WTO on the matter. She pointed out that based on past experience, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago invoked Article 18 of GATT, entitled Governmental Assistance to Economic Development, which allowed the state to increase its bound rate of duty immediately. So in our respectful submission, you read the evidence that is before you, together with the expert evidence, and we would respectfully ask you to reject the black and white evidence of Mr. Nicely, but in our respectful submission, you don't even need to go so far. I think all you need to say is, based on the expert evidence before us, it is entirely unclear whether as one expert contends what was done was inconsistent with GATT or whether as the other expert contends it is consistent with and in conformity with Article 18, what you take away from that is, and we will come to it, if it is that this court has heard expert evidence and the position is not clear, A for GRI, what are ministers of government in courted going to do with the question? And we will come to that. So is there anything else I can assist you with, Justice Sherman, or can I move on? Much obliged. Sorry, Mr. Uh, uh, just one point. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, you just quoted the representative of Trinidad in 2019, and um, he or she was speaking about earlier experience. Do we have... So apparently the state of Trinidad and Tobago had some experience with with this uh, provision, um, but I can't remember if I have seen anything of that. Um, no. I don't think it is in the evidence, is it? I agree with you, Justice Witt. I haven't seen anything uh, that suggests that Trinidad and, to and Tobago made an approach under Article 80. No doubt it was under consideration, but I'm not aware of an actual uh, notification that emanated from Trinidad and Tobago to WTO. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, could that Please have been the, the state number. of Grenada? I don't think so from the from the tenor of it. I'm not certain. Um, but I, we do know, and I think Dr. Brown gave the evidence that there were other jurisdictions in CARICOM that may have had recourse to it. Thank you. The page Sorry, number, Justice please, um, to speak, of the RHD7, I think you said? 172 of 174. 172. Thank you. Much obliged. I got to the point where I was summarizing what the president had said following the, the, you know, the interface between the two experts. And the president's words were, the experts are unable to agree. They disagree. They have different perspectives on the issue. And we say in the light of that evidence, how are the ministers of quota, not experts in WTO law, who may not reasonably be expected to have an understanding of the intricacies of WTO law that even we as lawyers don't have, neither quota nor CARICOM having any obligations under WTO law expected to assess or determine whether a measure or proposed measure is WTO compliant, which it seems to us is at the heart of the claim on submissions. In response to a question from Dr. Bob Schieffer, the claimant's witness, Mr. Nicely, accepted that under the DSU, a violation of GATT WTO can only be made by following the rules and procedures of the dispute settlement body. And there has been no determination by that body that Trinidad and Tobago has violated any provisions of GATT. Further, he accepted that there was no precedent out of the WTO on this issue and in response to a question from Justice Rajnath Lee, Mr. Nicely indicated he could not, and to use his words, safely see that the state of Trinidad and Tobago had acted inconsistently with its WTO obligations until there was a determination by the WTO DSB. And that is exactly the position that we have been advocated. It is not for Mr. Nicely, with the greatest respect to him or to me, or to anyone else to opine and conclude that any member state is in violation of the WTO treaty until the WTO dispute resolution organs have determined that question. It is premature 
and it was the greatest respect um, out of place to use, use a, a local expression. In our respectful submission, all of the evidence before the court at its highest establishes is that there are different views on whether the state of Trinidad and Tobago appears to have acted consistently or inconsistently with its obligations under GATT. We do know, as the excerpt that I've just read for you indicates, Coted was aware of the notification since 2019, and notwithstanding the statement made by the representative of Grenada, Coted proceeded to unanimously authorize the suspension. And interestingly, in the 2020 challenge before the court last year to that suspension, brought by one of the claimants before you here, Mojilal Ramit and Sons Contracting Limited, this was not a ground of challenge advanced by the claimants. In summary, we respectfully submit that the claimants have failed to prove their case, either that the implementation of the 50% CET by the state of Trinidad and Tobago on other hydraulic cement was to use their language for an improper purpose, that is to frustrate or negative their businesses or to, to cease trading with Turkey, it is not ultra-virus, it is not disproportionate in the, in the way that this court has construed what disproportionate means, and I think CARICOM has helpfully set that out in their submissions by, by way of the interpretation ruling. It is not irrational, it is not illegal, and the decision of the quoted in November 2020 is not ultra-virus, it is not unlawful, it is not disproportionate, it is not irrational, it is not unreasonable, it is not illegal, as a consequence of which, in our respectful submission, the claim should be dismissed. The issues on which we wish to give the court some assistance are one, and I respectfully disagree with my learned friend that jurisdiction is not an issue. Jurisdiction is and must be the first issue that this court should resolve. That is, does this court have jurisdiction to adjudicate and pronounce on the claimant's allegations that the state of Trinidad and Tobago is violating and or acting inconsistently with its obligations under Article 2 or Article 18 of GATT, another international treaty which provides for its own dispute resolution mechanism and which has not been incorporated into the revised treaty of Chagaramas? As you will see from the claimant's pleadings and submissions, this allegation has been worded in a myriad of ways, but whichever way you look at it and whichever language you, 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 cho you choose to pounce upon, what they're asking this court to say is that quoted in determining the state's request for suspension of the CT was required to have satisfied itself that the state's notification to WTO in November 2019 is WTO compliant or valid under WTO law in authorizing a departure from a bound rate of 5%. And I think that is the point that Justice Jamada was alluding to. The second matter on which we wish to address the court is, do any of the provisions of the RTC identified by the claimants, that is Article 6D, 9 and 83 require quoted to one, determine or satisfy itself of a member state's compliance with its WTO GATT obligations, and two, take into account in arriving at a decision, take it into account in arriving at a decision on an application made under Article 83. And lastly, we will turn to whether the 2020 quoted decision is to use the language of the originating application Ultravirus, and of course, in determining ultravirus, we go to the four corners of the RTC. Unlawful, similarly, disproportionate, irrational, unreasonable, or illegal, on the ground that the state has breached its duty of consultation under Article 26. So we go now to jurisdiction. Respectfully submit, it is beyond dispute that this court's jurisdiction is conferred and circumscribed by Article 211 of the RTC and Article 12.1d of the agreement establishing the Caribbean Court of Justice. In our respectful submission, the language of these provisions is clear. 
the court's jurisdiction conferred by the contracting parties to the RTC is limited to hearing and determining disputes concerning the interpretation and application of the RTC. That is where this court's jurisdiction is grounded. In other words, the court's jurisdiction does not extend to determining whether a contracting party to the RTC has breached the provisions of another treaty, such as the, R the WTO agreements or GATT. We, in, in support of this, we have cited this court's judgment in Myrie against the state of Barbados number no. two, which was a claim for declarations that the defendant state of Barbados had violated the claimant's fundamental human rights and freedoms contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the American Convention on Human Rights. The state of Barbados objected to the grant of the orders on the ground of jurisdiction. And at paragraph 10 of the judgment, which you will find at page 4803 of the record, the court stated, the court's jurisdiction is established and circumscribed, and we emphasize the word circumscribed, by the parameters of the RTC and the agreement establishing the court. Article 211 of the RTC and Article 12 of the agreement constrain, and this is the language of the court, the court to emanate and apply the RTC and secondary legislation emanating from the treaty. The court has no jurisdiction to adjudicate violations of international human rights treaties and conventions. Those instruments generally provide for their own dispute resolution mechanism, which must be the port of call, very helpful language, for an aggrieved person who alleges a breach of those treaties. The court therefore agrees with Barbados that it lacks jurisdiction to make the declarations and orders sought by Ms. Myrie relating to breaches of her human rights. So in this case, the court recognized that its jurisdiction does not extend to adjudication upon violations of treaties and conventions outside of the RTC. Not that we needed the court to say that because we think it is clear from a fair interpretation of the provisions of the RTC. But in any event, this decision constitutes binding precedent pursuant to Article 221 of the treaty and applies with equal force here in the context of the GATT 1994 and other WTO agreements. Uh, Mr. Speak, may I ask you a question on this point? Certainly. Um, I, I'm following your argument very closely. Um, now, the only question I wanted to raise with you has to do with, I think it's Article 217 of the revised treaty which says that in exercising the original jurisdiction, the court shall apply such rules of international law as may be applicable. Now, I take it that we, we are going to be applying international law uh, further to the interpretation and application of the provisions of the treaty. But some of those provisions concern the operation of quoted and how it goes about uh, making its decisions. Um, assuming you agree with those um, premises, would you then not agree that in interpreting and applying the provisions regarding the decision making powers of quoted, it is permissible and indeed required for this court to have regard to such rules of international law as may be applicable. We are much obliged for that intervention. We're actually coming to that point, uh, but just to summarize our, our position, yes, 217.1 says so, you shall apply rules of international law. And certainly in Mary, what, we, what the court was talking about was principles of international human rights law. But in our respectful submission, the claimants have not identified any principles of international trade law which can properly fall within what the court can apply under Article 217.1, and you'll permit me to develop it. So sure. as to the, dis as to the dis no, distinction... Uh, no, sorry, before, <laughs> whilst developing it, maybe you could bear in mind the, the concern I have, because I'm still trying to, to grapple with this, you see. Um, the claimants in one breath do suggest, um, you could say, and you said they've used different language, and I agree with you entirely, 
um, that there should be some kind of pronouncement on whether the measure by Trinidad and Tobago is WTO compliant or consistent. But they use other language as well, as I think you, you said earlier. Uh, language to the effect that quoted should take into account the obligation of the relevant member state. Um, to have, the WTO. have regard to my brother, have regard to. <laughs> or have regard, indeed. Um, so do, do you not agree then that in, in interpreting the role of quoted in this way, that this court um, needs to take into account the relevant international rules in, in this regard? Well, in, in our respectful submission, that begs the question, what are the relevant international rules? I would see if the claimants were able to articulate some clear principle or rule of international law that the uh, that quoted should have applied, then we well within 2217. But in our respectful submission, they have not been able to do that. With respect, was, I think I think Mr. Benjamin was very clear um, that he was thinking of rules such as um, good faith, um, Pacta Sun Servanda, the obligation on member states to abide by their international commitments. Well, I think you have foreshadowed much of what we're going to see, but can I assure ah, you that yeah. we will be dealing we will be dealing with the good faith obligation? Much obliged. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So as to the distinction that the claimants seek to make between jurisdiction and applicable law, the court in Myrie number two made clear at paragraph 10, as Justice Anderson anticipated. That as an international court authorized by Article 217 of the RTC to apply such rules of international law as may be applicable in the resolution of a claim properly brought in its original jurisdiction, the court would take into account principles of international human rights law when seeking to shape and develop relevant community law. But in our respectful submission, the claimants have failed to identify any principles of international trade law which they asked the court to adjudicate, to apply in the adjudication of this claim. What they invite the court to consider and determine as if it were the designated decision maker under the RTC, which we know it is not, is that the state breached and or failed to comply with specific provisions of the GATT. And as a consequence, it renders the decision taken by quoted a nullity. As the court properly held in Myrie, this court is not the forum for resolving such allegations. The appropriate port of call, to use the language of the court, is the relevant dispute resolution mechanism provided for by GATT. And in this regard, we remind the court of the WTO panel statements in the case European Communities Measures Affecting Trade in Commercial Vessels Dispute, a case cited by Mr. Nicely, you will find that at page 2676 of the record, that Article 23 of the Understanding on Rules and Procedures Governing the Settlement of Disputes, which governs dispute resolution in the WTO, has been interpreted as more than just an exclusive jurisdiction clause. It precludes, and this is the language of the case, all WTO members from seeking to obtain results that can be achieved through the remedies of the DSU by means other than recourse to the DSU. And this includes removal of the allegedly inconsistent measure. You'll have heard my learned friend talk about quashing the decision of Coated. And Mr. Nicely agreed with the proposition contained in that case under cross-examination yesterday. Respectfully submit that the court statements in Mary apply with greater force in this case given one, the clear statements by the WTO as to how it views its dispute settlement mechanism and the obligation on its members to use it. And in this regard, there was a very helpful exchange between Justice Anderson and Mr. Benjamin in relation to the transactional nature of WTO, which Justice Anderson has helpfully broken down to mean negotiating, agreeing, and coming to some uh, particular satisfactory solution. And two, the fact that the individuals before the court in its original jurisdiction pursuant to Article 222 of the RTC are espousing a claim which their contracting party is entitled to make and are standing in the shoes of their respective member state before the court. And we, we respectfully submit that this is a very, very important consideration. As Dr. Brown asked rhetorically, and we do as well, 
uh, are the claimants suggesting that a private entity, first, second, or third claimant, has greater rights than its own member state to ask this court for determination as to the legality of a measure initiated by a member state by reference to WTO law when its own state is expressly precluded from doing so under WTO law? We respectfully submit it would be absurd to suggest that a national of a member state, not a party to the WTO agreements, can achieve what a member state, which is a party, cannot do. That is obtain a ruling from this court that only a dispute resolution body of the WTO is competent to give. Further, the claimant's su suggestion that this is permissible since individuals have no local standard before the WTO DSB is in our respectful submission both illogical and unsound since the WTO agreements, including GATT, unlike, for example, the human rights treaties considered in MIRI, do not intend to confer rights on individuals. We know that the claimants seek to rely on EU case law, and they've mentioned the cases of Fedial, my learned friend referred to it today, European Commission on, against Hungary, Bogiazzi and Petrotub, to say that this court has jurisdiction to determine the allegation that the state of Trinidad and Tobago failed to modify lawfully or effectively its boundary at the WTO, as a consequence of which the 2020 quoted decision is unlawful. We respectfully submit that all of these authorities are inapplicable and distinguishable. First, and importantly, the EU is a party to the WTO agreements. It has assumed the obligations and powers previously exercised by its member states under WTO, and it can be held liable for its actions under WTO law. But as Dr. Mr. Nicely accepted yesterday, the, com the Caribbean community as a separate juridical person from its member states has not done so under the Treaty of Chagaramas. It is further evidenced, apart from what Mr. Nicely said, by the fact that, for example, the CARICOM member states each submit individual trade policy reviews to WTO, some of which are before the court. It is therefore erroneous for the claimants to submit that the RTC gives the community and GOTED complete jurisdiction, they say, over the tariff rates of the RTC member rates. Neither the community nor GOTED conducts a member state's negotiation or renegotiation of the tariff findings at WTO. And as was made clear by Dr. Brown, CARICOM member states retain their individual voices at the WTO. While COTED has an express role in the establishment and operation of the CT, the RTC preserves the ability of member states to impose internal taxes and fiscal charges on goods imported from third states. So, for example, Article 90 sets that out, or they can take measures intended to regulate trade flows. And you heard Dr. Brown talk yesterday about the other charges and duties which are imposed by the state of Barbados, quite independent of an application to quoted for suspension of the CT. That is entirely permissible under RTC. Second reason why those cases are inapplicable and distinguishable is that the majority of states comprising the EU follow the Monist tradition where ratified international treaties are incorporated into domestic law without more. This is the opposite of the dualist tradition of many member CARICOM member states, where ratified international treaty does not become part of the domestic law unless incorporated. And the GATT has not been incorporated into the domestic law of the state of Trinidad and Tobago. Third, despite following the Monish tradition and therefore having the WTO agreements as part of the corpus of EU law, the general rule in the EU is that the court will not rely on WTO obligations as a basis for invalidating community acts. And the court has before the cases of International Fruit Company and Portugal against the Council at tabs 3 and 13 of CARICOM submissions, which you will find at 3981 and 4282 of the record. 
WTO law establishes, or EU law establishes, sorry, that there are only two well-recognized exceptions to that rule. One, where the relevant EU instrument intends to implement a particular obligation assumed in the context of the WTO agreement, such as in the federal case, and that was apparent from the extracts that my learned friend read this morning. And second, where the community instrument expressly transposes a WTO agreement, such as in the Petrotop case. Neither of these narrow exceptions apply to the circumstances of this case. And Your Honor, Justice Anderson and Dr. Brown had a very helpful exchange yesterday in relation to specific provisions of the RTC, which on their face are intended to incorporate WTO obligations. Suffice it to say that that is not the case for Article 6D, 9, 9, or 83 of the RTC, which are in issue in this case. So therefore, in closing on jurisdiction, we respectfully submit that this court has no jurisdiction to adjudicate on the claimant's allegation that the state has breached and or acted inconsistently with its obligations under a treaty other than the RTC, and that this therefore cannot constitute a basis for invalidated the 2020 quoted decision in an application for judicial review. We turn next to a proper interpretation of the articles invoked by the claimants, that is 6, 9, 9, and 83. And we we'll take that- before, before you go there, um, would you not agree that foreign law can be proved? So let's say I go back to the French law example. Of course, the French courts will be will have the jurisdiction to decide French what French law says, but sometimes it is uh, of importance, even in another jurisdiction, to know what it says, and then usually it can be proven by experts. Now, of course, you are saying that in this case, that clear uh, rule that. Uh, that the claimants uh, propose. Um, it is clear from the evidence that that it is not such a clear rule. But apart from that, uh, is it not possible? And actually, actually, um, Mr. Nicely said so. That yes, you can also prove WTO law through the, through other means. You can prove it even without having uh, decisions from. WTO tribunals panels uh, on that particular subject. Of course, then the next question would be: Okay, if you can prove that a certain rule exists and that a state has breached that rule, then I I, I understand the claimant to say then then you have to look at Quotet and what Quotet did was assisting the state in breaching that law, and that kind of assistance breaching that law is um, not in good faith or a violation of good faith. So uh, that that is how I understand them. So what would you say? So I'm not talking about jurisdiction. I think uh, that's quite clear jurisdiction. We do not have jurisdiction to decide uh, certain issues. But um, if it is that WTA law, WTO law is of some relevance, and you can, of course, have a discussion on that, but if it is relevant in a case, can it not just be proved? I'm very grateful, Mr. President, that you've raised that issue because when you mentioned it yesterday, it caused me to think because, of course, that is a concept that's familiar in domestic law. So there's a matter that I was involved in that the court heard evidence on Lebanese law. But of course, we're not comparing like with like. We're not comparing a common law jurisdiction with another common law jurisdiction or common law jurisdiction and a civil law jurisdiction. The, the, the jurisprudence of WTO is not analogous to either domestic law or indeed the jurisprudence of this court or community law. It is not. And my learned friend has accepted whether he uses the words flexibility or transactional or hybridity that it's of a completely different nature. It is not, and I think, uh, you know, Dr. Brong used very graphic language when she said, you know, we tend to see things like, to use the analogy of a traffic light, red or green, but in WTO law, it's, it's amber, and therefore you, it is impossible in our respectful submission 
for this court and it would be wrong in our respectful submission as we would expect this court to guard its its jurisdiction jealously for this court to usurp the function of a WTO dispute resolution body and come to determination based on expert evidence before you that something is or is not inconsistent with or in violation of or in breach of a provision of GATT. It would just be simply wrong and out of order. So I reject with respect the analogy uh, of comparing English law with French law. We are not comparing like with like. We cannot go to WTO law and take a judgment or a decision as we would of, of the European community and say, well, I will extract from that what is the position. The whole tenor of WTO law, as made clear by Mr. Nicely under cross-examination and Dr. Brown, is its flexibility. There is no hard and fast rule. If someone alleges that there is a contravention of a, of a particular provision, it goes nowhere unless they take it up before a dispute resolution body. Somebody may think that it is inappropriate. Someone may think it is inconsistent, but that status cannot be attached to it until a dispute resolution body so rules. And before that body rules, and even after the body rules, inherent in this transactional nature of the, of the regime is that it is open to the parties to agree consensually. And therefore, how can, you know, in that context, how would it be right for this court to say, for example, I have heard expert Mr. Nicely, and this court accepts that what the state of Trinidad and Tobago did was in violation of the, of the GATT. In our respectful submission, that would just be incomprehensible, and we say it with the greatest of respect. And that is why we, we took the principal position that you know it would be wrong for the court to hear evidence of that because at the end of the day what is the court to make of it of course the court decided yes i will hear the witnesses but at the end of the day what is the court left with it throws its hands up in the air and says well i heard two respected experts and they simply couldn't agree and it is not for this court to, to adjudicate as to whether you know, which of them is the correct version that is the exclusive jurisdiction of the WTO dispute resolution body. Notwithstanding your earlier disclaimer, uh, Mrs. Speak, I, I'm afraid you're in danger of sounding like a WTO expert. Well, I, I disclaim any such suggestion. <laughs> I would be embarrassed uh, to, to so suggest. Uh, so if I cont continue in relation sure. to uh, the articles that under consideration. We we started with the with the the premise that the treaty must be interpreted as a whole, and its meaning is not to be determined merely by looking at particular phrases detached from their context. Bearing in mind that it may be they may be interpreted in more than one sense. So the starting point, and of course at the heart of it, is the Vienna Convention on the Interpretation of Treaties. You look at the ordinary meaning of the terms in their context, which comprises the treaty text as a whole, including its preamble and annexes, and in the light of the RTC's object and purpose, that of course is the general rule of treaty interpretation. Of course, if the application of the general rule means that leaves the meaning of the provision ambiguous or obscure, or leads to a result that is manifestly absurd or unreasonable, one then resorts to the supplementary rule of treaty interpretation, which involves looking at the preparatory work of the treaty and the circumstances of its conclusion. We have set out for the court in our respectful submission what is the proper interpretation of Article 6D, and we set that out in detail at paragraphs 26 to 35 of our written submissions. We don't propose to go them over. What we do say in summary is that applying the well-established general and supplementary rules of treaty interpretation, which includes recourse to the preparatory work of the RTC and the circumstances of its conclusion, it is clear that the RTC did not intend for the term trade in Article 60 to be construed as the buying and importation of goods from third states, which undermine regional production efforts. The protection of regional production and an emphasis on export-led growth being we respectfully submit at the heart of the RTC. We submitted to adopt the interpretation of 6D, which the claimants commend to the court, is to run counter to the entire essence of the RTC, 
and to contradict its clear object and purpose. In any event, we respectfully submit that on the evidence, the claimants have failed to establish that the state has in any way sought to eliminate trade with Turkey. As a matter of fact, the material before the court suggests a large imbalance in the value of goods imported into Trinidad and Tobago from Turkey as compared to those exported from Trinidad and Tobago to Turkey. And the claimants, at least one of the witnesses, accepted in cross-examination that a wide range of goods continues to be imported into Trinidad and Tobago from Turkey, the other witness not being in a position to dispute it. Article 9, again, we're not going to spend too much time on that because the only two referenced it in the claimant's pleading, and all Article 9 does is contain a general undertaking on implementation, and it doesn't take the claimant's case any further, having regard to what we submit as a proper interpretation of Article 16. Coming now to the meat of the matter, Article 83, which is entitled Operation of the Common External Tariff, and which enables a member state to apply to quoted for authorization to suspend the CT on any item. The wording of paragraph three of the article, and that is what the court is in the business of, interpreting the treaty. The wording of paragraph three is very specific. This was an amended article. Member states were very careful to set out, to use the phrase that has become common, what quoted should have regard to. Take into account is the language used of three. So three says, in its consideration of an application to suspend a seat on an item, quoted shall, where applicable, take into account. Member states were very clear. These are the factors that you're required to take into account where applicable. And as we know, some of them are not applicable. So we move straight to those that are applicable in this case, which are D. There's a critical shortfall in government revenue being experienced by that member state. Something in our respectful submission that persons, importers consulted, can say very little about. F, there's need to support an industry in that member state. Similarly, a matter within the purview of a member state in determining its economic and fiscal policy. G, the product is of strategic importance to the economic development of that member state, ditto. But the court has held in the consultation judgment uh, that importers, domestic importers of cement are entitled to be consulted. Five, paragraph five of article three says an application to suspend the applicable seat on an item must be supported by information as prescribed by Coated from time to time. So our submissions on article 83 are first. It's as the title indicates, the article is intended to operationalize the CT established under Article 82, which according to this court's well-settled jurisprudence is regarded as a fundamental pillar of the CSME, intended to one, encourage and promote production of goods within CARICOM, two, strengthen the productive sector, three, safeguard regional production against competition from like foreign products, and four, create an enlarged and more assured market for regional producers and manufacturers. The second point we wish to make is that this court has already pronounced on the object and purpose of Article 83. So in the derogation judgment, as we call it, which was TCL and Arawak Cement's challenge to the actions of the state of Barbados in derogating from a suspension of the CT granted by Coated, and you will find that case at tab nine of our bundle of authorities, this court recognized that paragraphs 35 and 38, that applications by a member state under Article 83 to suspend the CT and impose a higher tariff fall within the realm of, to use the language of the court, national economic policy measures advanced by a member state based upon its own deliberate considerations, which may be for the purpose of undertaking greater or additional protection for its local industries than that considered appropriate under community standards. Similarly, in the consultation judgment, which is the first authority in the claimant's bundle, the court at paragraph 73 made two important pronouncements in our respectful submission. One, applications for suspension of the CT under Article 83 and for the approval of a higher tariff are to use the words of the court with which we respectfully agree ultimately a matter 
of domestic economic policy determined by whether the applying member wish to promote the importation of the subject good from a third state or whether it wish to encourage local production of the good and two it should be left to the administration of the member states to take whatever measures they consider appropriate so in our respectful submission to the extent that the claimants seek to amend 833 inferentially by their submissions and to ask the court to read in any additional matter or matters that quoted is required to take into account on an application for an alteration or suspension or to add qualifications to the express considerations agreed by member states under article 83.3 set out by the framers of the RTC. They have one cited no authority for their approach and we respectfully submit that those submissions are without merit. As to the claimant's allegations that a member state is obliged to demonstrate by way of evidence that a shortfall in revenue is attributable to the good in respect of which the suspension of the CT is sought and that the imported cement is also of strategic importance to the state's economic development, we have addressed these at paragraph 43 of our submission and we say there is no support for this submission in either the text of the RTC or the jurisprudence of this court. With respect to the claimant's uh, suggestion. Speak, yes, I, I understand that particular point that you were making. Um, but I was wondering um, uh, the argument there is a critical shortfall in our revenue that would usually be a good reason to raise your import duty so that you get more money in. Uh, but if you combine that with a quota arrangement, then um, I, then I do not understand this reason very much because then if you if you have a quota arrangement, then you will see to it that less revenue will come in instead of more. So I was trying to understand this particular point. Maybe you can give me some uh, enlightenment on it. Well, I don't know whether I can enlighten you that much on government policy, but as I understand it, uh, we satisfy the criteria under Article 83 to uh, mm. apply for suspension and then the government all also the decision makers also decided look to support the local industry uh, which was you know suffering significantly from the imports and to manage and to manage the shortage of foreign exchange it was necessary also to uh, have a licensing regime and the imposition of a quota so again, it's a matter of the government or the state balancing the economic objectives and deciding where it will come down. So you may be right that by imposing a quota, you reduce revenue, but you're also encouraging your local manufacturer, which is earning foreign exchange to produce and bring foreign exchange into the, the coffers of Trinidad and Tobago. But as we say, to use the language of the court, it, that is ultimately a matter left to the to the um, discretion of the administration of the states in the exercise of their own economic interests. So, to speak on the question of quotas, I mean, legality apart, and that's not for us, obviously states are entitled to do what they are in law entitled to do. Uh, it's not for us, especially with that kind of policy, to decide that that policy is right or wrong. But the argument on the quota that uh, Mr. Benjamin raised in terms of judicial review of Cotet's decision, the duty and responsibility of Cotet and the duty and responsibility of the state of Trinidad and Tobago, i.e. to disclose to Cotet that it was considering introducing a quota or licensing system. Um, if that had been so prior to the quoted decision, would that have been a material consideration and or a material fact that ought to have been, been brought to the attention of quoted? I'm not on the merits at all. I'm much obliged, Your Honor. I mean, in our respectful submission, the evidence is clear that at the time when the approach was made by the state to Trinidad to, to quoted, 
there was no decision made in relation to quota. So that's, we can just knock that point out of this case and we will come to deal with that. Evidentially, there is no support for any suggestion that there was a non-disclosure to quoted of any governmental decision to impose a quota. Timing wise, it just did not happen. But the more important juridical question which you have raised, which we think is important on a consideration of Article 83 is, the answer is no. No. Because your, your, your position is the instrument sets out the factors that are to be considered. Correct. And Therefore, sorry. To, 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 to introduce those would be to, introduce, to be reading in, you say, new consideration. So, so, so that's why it's linked to this. I'm raising it in this context because I, I want for you to articulate it. Yes, how, we want you, to... how do you articulate? Because on, let's assume that we are against. I'm not saying we are. I'm just saying assume that we say, oh, on the evidence, no, the government uh, clearly or likely knew that they wanted to introduce a two quota. No problem. Articulate your response to that because because if that is something that is material to the decision making of quota in relation to tariffs to increase or decrease. Um, then that non-disclosure may or may not uh, impugn the decision. We, we much How obliged to you your answer, yes. yeah. Well, I think you are perfectly correct. The starting point is Article 83, and as you have indicated, the member states have made it clear what quota is required to take into account, and my learned friends, by suggesting that if, in fact, government had decided to impose a quota, that is something that they were obliged to disclose to quoted in our respectful submission. That is wrong because that is not what the language of the treaty, which the court is interpreting, says. Um, in any event, the, the material before the court is that other states, such as the state of Barbados and Belize, have imposed what Dr. Brown referred to as OTC, other O. o, o ODC. Yes, <laughs> what you said. Yes. ODC. Other, other duties and charges. I was saying other charges. Other <laughs> duties and charges outside of the CT regime, which is perfectly permissible under WTO law, incidentally, and is authorized by Article 91 of the RTC. So that's a separate provision altogether. And no state is obliged on an application to quote it for suspension under Article 83 to disclose any other economic or policy decisions that do not touch and concern the application for the suspension. I would like to um, stay a little bit longer on this on this territory, if we may, because I, I think that the president and Justice Jamada have raised um, a, a very um, important issue, which I think the court, frankly, could benefit from your view, the view of Trinidad and Tobago. I, I think it's a very, very important um, point that we should sort of take our time over. Um, I read in your defense that you did not believe that it was the uh, requirement of Trinidad and Tobago to provide evidence of the suggestions which which would prompt or justify uh, an application for a suspension of the CET. Um, are, are you are you going that far? Uh, are are you saying that all that Trinidad and Tobago has to do is to use the language of Article eighty three? and suggest that there has been a shortfall in government revenue or any of the other grounds um, that's relied on, and that the bare assertion without any production of any evidence at all suffices? Uh, are, you, are you going to that extreme? Absolutely not, Your Honor. We would never be so bold as to make a submission like that. You, if you are, if you are not making... Not to interrupt your answer, not to interrupt your answer, but you did say in particle, uh, paragraph 46, that there is no requirement to produce any evidence of these grounds that are suggested for the suspension of the CET. 
Let me just have a look at it. I believe the, the context was the connection. In other words, the point that I just raised, that you have to show that the shortfall in government revenue is connected to the importation of the non-community good. In other words, the point that I, I, I just said we wouldn't spend too much time on because it's it's in our submission, but I was not, we were not suggesting that you could simply, you know, by rote, just repeat the language of the F and G and expect quota to be satisfied. No, 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 we would never make such a suggestion. Well, I, I'm very pleased about that because we, we need, obviously, the, the uh, assistance of the member states to help us decide what our proper role is. And if we are going to be in a position to review properly the decision of, of quota, we obviously need to know what the member states think um, the scope of our duties um, is. Now, um, I, I, I was very intrigued by your reference somewhere in your submissions that the basis on which uh, a decision by the member state could be impugned included or probably were restricted to bad faith and manifest absurdity. Did, did I get that right? That th those are the bases on which you think that the, the member states um, actions could be could be impugned. And whilst you're looking for that, if, if that is the case, then I assume that if quoted um, made a decision uh, which was um, also either made in bad faith or was manifestly absurd, that would be a basis on which this court could impugn that quoted decision. Again, I'm just trying to get assistance from you as to the scope of our powers. Well, I, I think, I mean, we will look for the uh, the provision in the submissions, but we think we were using the language of the of the court. So in our submissions at paragraph 64, we talked about the threshold for judicial intervention being high, which we will come to based on this court's own decision in TCL against CARICOM number two, and which says the court will intervene where a member state or the community abuses its discretionary power or seeks and obtains a suspension of the CT for improper purposes. But we weren't respectfully suggesting that that delimited the circumstances. In fact, the clear jurisprudence of this court is rule of law. And whatever rule of law entails, as it is being developed by the case law, uh, would indicate the the breadth of the review that this court will will undertake of a decision of an organ of character. Thank you for that. So going back then to what the president asked you about the continuity or lack thereof between the um, the the requirement to increase foreign exchange and the connection with the imposition of a quota. Um, are we in a position then to consider whether it is manifestly absurd to uh, want to increase foreign exchange at the same time as imposing a quota? Are, are we allowed to look at that? With, res with respect, we think that that would be um, engaging in a review of a policy decision rather than the legality of a decision, because it seems to me once we fall within one or other of the criteria in Article 83, the decision of quoted is a proper decision, intra-virus and legal. And therefore, if it is the state takes some other action that may be incompatible with raising government revenue, that with respect is not a matter for quota to investigate as a ground for rejecting the application for suspension as we respectfully submit, is not a ground for the court to invalidate a decision of quoted. So the, the, the jurisdiction of the court is confined to reviewing the decision at the time when the decision was made. And as we've submitted the, the evidence before you is that at the time, there was not any decision to impose a quota. So uh, quoted was properly informed of all the relevant considerations and in this regard, we would invite the court, and I think it's made clear in the submissions of Belize, if you read the report of Quoted, you get a clear sense that this, this, this organ of CARICOM was not simply rubber stamping 
uh, the application. As a matter of fact, the court might be a little embarrassed by the very frank expressions of opinion as to how far the court has Good. gone. But the, but the member states were very, very clear uh, that the criteria set, set, set out in 83 had been more than satisfied and that the decision was properly authorized. And, so, and this is why we are grateful for your assistance, because we also saw that spirited discussion represented in the documents. And obviously, uh, at the end of the day, we make a decision, but we want to make sure as far as possible that we are properly informed by the views of, of the member states. So you're saying then that if Trinidad and Tobago uh, considers that it needs to enhance its foreign exchange um, position, it can take a decision um, which moves in that direction, but at the same time, it could take another decision which could appear to be contradictory to that first, but is not necessarily so. And, and the difference is worked out in relation to the, the various policy uh, positions, implications of, of, of the government. Uh, yes. To which, to which we may not have access. I'm just trying to understand the but, logic. But I, I would not use with respect the, the language of contradictory. I might say that there might be another policy measure which does not achieve the full objective of what was intended by the suspension of the CT. But again, the government is in a position where it has to balance various interests. And if at this time the earning of foreign exchange and supporting an industry which has a capacity to earn foreign exchange is a critical policy decision, then certainly, you know, no statement with respect can come from the court questioning the validity or propriety of that approach. And I'm glad, you know, Your Honor raised the, the spirited discussion because I was a little embarrassed when I read it, but I do think it's important that the court understands what the views of the member states who have signed this treaty anticipated or foresaw that the treaty would provide. And of course, when judgments of this court are issued, which are binding, they are treated with the greatest of respect. But if there is consternation, as in fact that, that, that record reflects, consternation on the part of some member states as to how the treaty has been interpreted, I think not that it will affect the decision that you come to, but it's always important to look at that matters, you know, in its proper context. So, uh, you know, I, honestly, I, 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 I think I speak on behalf of my brothers and sisters to say that we are very grateful for what you just said. Um, could, could you could you also bear in mind, and I think you made the point earlier, and, and I'm sure General Council is very familiar with this, that the the parties to the treaty can uh, come to a subsequent agreement on the interpretation of provisions in the treaty. And that agreement must, and I think the language of the Vienna Convention is, be taken into account, but it's a euphemism, I'm sure, um, by the court. So that um, the spirit of discussion is fine. I, I, I'm sure that the court is, is um, you know, well accustomed to that kind of discussion. But it may be more productive, possibly, I respectfully suggest, that if member states are very exercised by any particular issue, they have a, a, a right to, to agree amongst themselves and to put forward an interpretation of particular provisions in the treaty, which this court must then um, take into account. We're very, grateful. We, we're very grateful for that um, uh, contribution, Justice Anderson. Well, I see my learned friend, Dr. Bob Schaefer, is there. And no doubt she will take that on board. But of course, we, we remind the court of the reality of how long it takes to get member states to agree to something of this nature, particularly when there are so many other priorities, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. But I hope that my learned friend, Dr. Bob Schieper, will take that forward because I think that does seem to be consonant with some of the sentiments expressed by member states. We're much obliged. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, if I am not overreaching, may I have from my own um, personal um, um, well-being, inquire how much longer you will be? I would say uh, perhaps a half an hour, and perhaps I can indicate that I had a conversation with my learned friend, Mr. Courtney, for Belize, 
and he indicated that he only anticipates that they will take uh, certainly less than um, less than 45 minutes and he would have no difficulty if the court agrees that I, I have any spillover that I take some of his time. So I would say I would estimate about half an hour, um, but of course it depends what, what on the- I'm, What I'm looking at is a schedule. I appreciate that. Meal time, <laughs> we have gone past, you see. It will not yeah. take us half an hour, it will take us to 1.30. Um, being a creature of habit, um, I do like to know that um, my meals will be as scheduled. So I'm not sure if the chair will call for a break at this stage and have you continue after lunch or, or whatever, but um, really. Thank you very much. Mr. President, can I please uh, inquire whether you would be minded to take the break now? And I will continue after the break. I don't want to um, test everyone's patience. No, I was well about being. to ask you how long you needed, but um, Justice Barrow uh, uh, was first. So uh, I think uh, it would be a good moment to have a break now. Um, then you can continue. Um, uh, let's say it's uh, it's five past one. We can continue. I think we have to take our time. Quarter to two, we can continue. Uh, maybe that gives you also time to see how much more you can uh, shrink the last part of your um, of your uh, submissions. Um, I I saw the 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 notes. Uh, speaking notes uh, of Belize, so I, I got from that that they wouldn't uh, wouldn't have need that much time. Um, but um, anyway, um, I think we have to take the break now. Um, so my suggestion is we continue quarter quarter to two, and that um, well, I hope you can uh, limit your last remarks without us interrupting, <laughs> um, maybe to 15, 20 minutes um, before we continue with uh, Dr. Bob Schaefer. Um, if obliged. there is no objection to that, then I, I, I suggest we will adjourn till quarter to two, and then Ms. Peek will continue her, her oral submissions. If you oblige, Your Honours, very grateful to Justice Barrow.
Okay, everybody present, and then uh, uh, Mr. Judge, Kupin. just judge, just a second. I I'm not seeing. Are you seeing Mr. Justice Barrow? Well, I'm not seeing him, but I. Am. I am not seeing him. I'm seeing. I'm just seeing. Right. He's but dead. oh, yes, yeah, seeing him. Yes, good. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. So we are complete. So, Ms. Peek, uh, please continue. Your Honor. Yes, yeah. Mr. Jeremy. Um, the speaker and I have spoken during the interval. Uh -huh. And with respect to time management, I too am for the second intervener. I'm prepared to do as the first intervener has and to cede some of my time to, to her. Okay. On condition, is... of course, that I also be allowed to, to do a short speaking note for you. I, I promise that I will not be prolix. Okay, no, that is not a not a problem. I think um, all the well, both the defendants and both interveners are more or less in the same <laughs> same corner, but they have probably different perspectives here and there. So what we do not want is, of course, too much repetition or, or repetition at all. But we do appreciate that you have you all you all have your own perspective. So um, we we appreciate that you might have certain uh, things to add, as long as it doesn't come down to endless repeating the same arguments. But I'm 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 sure you are aware of that. So Ms. Peek, please continue. Sorry, come soon before you all before you all begin. I just want to draw to everyone's attention that the timetabling had us finishing at 4.30 this afternoon. I know that that is now a total impossibility, but I do ask counsel to bear in mind that there is in fact a, the matter of attention span after which one becomes tired and exhausted and we're not listening as much as when we first started. So those who are to come will punish for those who take too much time in the fore and mid ground. That's all. Thanks. Much obliged, and I apologize to my alerted friends in advance, and I thank Mr. Jeremy for his kind indulgence in affording me some more time. Your Honours, before I, I resume my submissions, there's an issue that I wanted to deal with that was raised by the President this morning, which is that the Permanent Secretary accepted that the bond rate is 5% in 2021. Of course, the Court will have a better note than we do of the exchange, but our note has my learned friend, Mr. Benjamin, um, putting to her or asking her whether the bond rate at the moment is 5%. Or are you aware, is the way he had phrased it, are you aware that the bond rate at the moment is 5%? And the permanent secretary answered, we notified. And he asked yeah. whether you accept in 2021 the bond rate is 5%. And she says, we notified. And somewhat unusually, uh, Justice Jamada apparently impatiently intervened and said, are you aware or not aware it is 5%? And the permanent secretary said, I am aware. So that is our note of the evidence. And we will ask you to take that together with the evidence which emerged during re-examination, where the permanent secretary emphasized that the notification was given in 2019 and had no duration, so still operates, taken together with the evidence of Dr. Brown, which makes it clear that under Article 18, upon the issuance of a notification to WTO, the member state can implement immediately uh, the new rate. So in, you know, I, I wouldn't want the court to go away or my learned friend uh, to say that there has been a concession by the state that the, the rate at the WTO level is 5%. Respectfully, we would invite the court to look at the evidence as a whole and to say, as we are all strangers, perhaps not the president to WTO law, that um, that is one of those areas that are not clear and it can really only be elucidated and finalized at WTO level. Uh, that's our respectful submissions on that part of the evidence. I can assure you that we that the court will make its assessment of the evidence uh, as it as it is. So and in in its entirety. So. 
and as as the president has intervened, I'm reminded that when uh, the re-examination of the permanent secretary was concluded, uh, the president indicated, well, we have to hear from the experts on that question. And in our respectful submission, it is not for a witness of fact to say as a matter of certainty what is the boundary. That is a matter on which the court has heard extensive expert evidence. And of course, the end result is that it is not clear and the parties, the experts have not agreed. So if I can just continue um, on the Article 83 point, and what we see in relation to that is that the claimants have not made reference in their submissions to the express language of 83, and in fact appear to ignore the rules of treaty interpretation, which they themselves have commended to the court. And as this court, and indeed all international courts recognize, the text of the treaty is what is paramount and the language reflects what the state's parties to the treaty contemplated and agreed to be bound by. So you will see, as we submit, there is no statement in either Article 82 or 83 of the RTC to the effect that in establishing and or operating the city, Cotet's powers are limited by the GATT or any other WTO agreement, or that Cotet is obliged to take into account a member state's obligations under the GATT WTO regime. This is in clear contrast to some of the provisions of the RTC mentioned by Justice Anderson to Dr. Brown yesterday. And they are Article 1166, which deals with imposition of provisional measures on countervailing duties. Article 148.2, measures relating to the services sector. And Article 157.3F, dealing with technical and financial assistance. So just to take an example, 1166 expressly incorporates certain provisions of WTO law in that it prohibits the member states from imposing countervailing duties without prior authorization from quoted and states that the determination and imposition of definitive countervailing shall be governed by the relevant provisions of the WTO agreement. So that article and the others mentioned by Justice Anderson show that where the framers of the RTC intended to incorporate into the RTC obligations arising on, under another treaty, they did so and they did so expressly. And as Dr. Brown made clear, when you have specific provisions in the treaty that mention the WTO, this is where you're actually incorporating WTO provisions into community law and where they can be relied upon before community organs and this court. To deal with good faith, the point raised by Justice Anderson and how far that can take us. We say to the extent that the claimants invoke the state's duty to perform its treaty obligations in good faith, we refer the court to the judgment of the House of Lords in the Roma Rights Center case, which you will find at tab one of the submissions of the state of Belize. And as the president of the court, Lord Bingham said at paragraph 18, however generous and purposive its approach to interpretation, the court's task remains one of interpreting the written document to which the contracting parties have committed themselves. It must interpret what they have agreed. It has no warrant to give effect to what they might or in an ideal world would have agreed. This would violate the rules, said Lord Bingham, also expressed in Article 31.1 of the Vienna Convention, that a treaty should be interpreted in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context. And at paragraph 19, he said, there is no want of good faith, and respectfully commend this to the court, if a state interprets a treaty as meaning what it says and declines to do anything significantly greater than or different from what it agreed to do. The principle that pacta sunt servanda cannot require departure from what has been agreed. And quoting two decisions of the International Court of Justice, he said, the principle of good faith is, as the court has observed, one of the basic principles governing the creation and performance of legal obligations, but it is not in itself a source of obligation where none would otherwise exist. And you will find similar language in the judgment of Lord Hope at paragraphs 58 to 63. You will find that at pages 5313 to 5316 of the record where Lord Hope cautioned against good faith being regarded as a source of law. So I hope that that assists the court. And we respectfully commend these statements to the court and submit that they conclusively dispose of any suggestion by the claimants that the state's duty to perform its obligations under the RTC in good faith 
imported to the RFTC the state's obligations under another treaty regime. In fact, what the claimants are seeking to do is to use the duty of good faith to enlarge what the contracting parties to the RTC agreed, which is contrary to the trite principle of treaty interpretation, where in the words of Lord Hope, everything depends on what the treaty itself provides. Melinded friends also seek to invoke the principle of systemic integration to submit that the RTC should be incorporated so that it integrates harmoniously with the WTO GATT regime. But in our respectful submission, this misses the point that there is no single wider international legal system to which all treaties belong. And this is supported by the academic article of McLaughlin on which the claimants rely. We say this principle of systemic integration cannot be used to import obligations from one treaty into another or to enlarge what the contracting parties to the treaty under consideration have agreed. International law is predicated on state consent. The starting point remains and must be the language of the treaty provision under consideration and the duty of the interpreter, in this case the Honourable Court, is to be faithful to the treaty text. Third, the claimants have failed to establish evidentially that the contracting parties to the RTC and quoted have in the performance of their obligations under the RTC, as they say, consistently treated the boundary rate as relevant and material in the suspension of the CT and have consistently adhered to the WTO regime for altering the boundary rate as a step in their performance of their RTC obligations. There's simply no evidence to support that allegation. Similarly, the claimants have not established that the WTO GATT bound rate regime is a relevant rule of international law applicable in the relations between parties to the RTC for the purpose of Article 313C of the Vienna Convention. And you will see, even though in their pleading they relied on customary international law, they've departed from that in their reply submissions and say it's really the WTO GATT bound rate regime on which they are relying as a relevant rule of international law. We say, quite contrary to what they have submitted, the undisputed evidence, as contained in several WTO policy reviews relied upon by CARICOM, namely those of Suriname, Jamaica, and Belize, and you will find these at pages 359 to 374 of the record, is that CARICOM member states do not always adhere to their WTO obligations and particularly tariff bindings. We highlight just one example for the court. In 2019, Suriname's applied rate for 597 tariff lines exceeded its bound rates with the application of tariffs above the round rate subject to a request for negotiations under Article 28 of GATT. You will find that at page 362 of the record, paragraph 12. So that since 2019, Suriname was applying tariff rates in excess of its bond rate before it modified its bond rate. And the claimants have not put any evidence before the court to contradict or to answer this documentary evidence. Fourth, and importantly, as Dr. Brown made clear in her evidence, and as Dr. Sorry, Mr. Nicely agreed, WTO law contains a great degree of flexibility, and the contracting parties to GATT 1994 afforded wide latitude in arriving at mutually agreed solutions. Dr. Brown made clear it's not only the text of GATT, which is, you know, Dr. Mr. Nicely focused on just two articles, which determines a party's obligations, but other sources, such as binding clarifications adopted by the Ministerial Conference and the General Council of WTO, the decisions of the contracting parties to GATT 1947, such as the safeguard decision of 28 November 79, referred to by Dr. Brown, as well as the Doha ministerial decision on implementation related issues and concerns, which reaffirmed that Article 18 of GATT is a special and differential treatment provision for developing countries and that recourse to it should, recourse to it should be less onerous than to Article 12 of GATT 1994. It is astounding in our, in our respectful submissions that Mr. Nicely, an expert before this court, could determine that none of these matters are relevant to this for this court's consideration, that he thought examining just two articles of the, of the uh, GATT without reference to the other documents, which must be construed together with it to arrive at a proper interpretation of the obligations of member states 
could be a satisfactory approach to what is accepted to be a very difficult question. We say, contrary to his approach, it is necessary to go beyond a basic textual analysis of certain provisions of GATT to determine whether the state of Trinidad and Tobago acted consistently with its WTO obligations in notifying of a modification to its bound rate in November 2019. We say that any determination of inconsistency under the relevant WTO dispute resolution mechanism does not result in nullification of the measure, which is one of the remedies sought in these proceedings, my learned friend said, quash or remit, but parties to disputes in the WTO have considerable freedom in arriving at mutually agreed solutions, which may even include maintaining a measure that is found to be WTO inconsistent. This is what Dr. Brown referred to when she said at paragraph 39 of her report that the transactional nature of the WTO does not fit well within traditional rule of no analyses. And she explained that even further in her oral evidence yesterday. This is one of the reasons why the EU has to date not given direct effect to provisions of the GATT in its legal system. And we refer the court to paragraph 21 of the International Food Company case, which is page 3989, and paragraph 42 of the Portugal and Council case, which is at uh, page 4296. Before closing, uh, and just as a matter of completeness, we respectfully submit, I should say closing on this point, Justice Barrow, <laughs> Respectfully submit that the statements of this court in the classification judgment, which suggests that Quartet's power to adjust the CT is limited by the bond rates committed to by CARICOM member states of the WTU, do not constitute starry decisis or binding precedent of the court pursuant to Article 221 of the RTC properly construed. We say so respectfully because the issue was neither argued by the parties nor fully deliberated upon by the court, and the statements of the court respectfully are not rooted in a textual examination and interpretation of Article 83 of the RTC, on which you have the party's assistance in this case. As we have submitted, and as Dr. Brown has noted, there is no mention of WTO GATT bound rates either in Article 83 or in the RTC as a whole. In this regard, we respectfully submit that there is nothing which establishes that the framers of the RTC intended that Quartet's power to adjust the CT is limited by the bond rates committed to by CARICOM member states at WTO, or that Quartet is required to take a member state's tariff binding at the WTO into account when establishing a CT or approving a request for suspension therefrom. In our respectful submission, Neither quoted nor this court is competent to adjudicate on and declare whether the state of Trinidad and Tobago has breached the provisions of the WTO agreements or any treaty other than the RTC. But we also say that the state's actions pursuant to the GATT, this is the approach that we commend to the court in accordance with WTO uh, jurisprudence, is that the state's actions pursuant to the GATT must be presumed to be proper, lawful, and or WTO compliant unless and until there is a determination to the contrary by the WTO dispute settlement body, which is the relevant dispute resolution mechanism under the WTO. Respectfully submit that in doing so, the accord, this court will be according respect to the organs of another international uh, organization as this court would expect another international organization to do if it was called upon to interpret the provisions of the RTC. We say to read in limits on Quartet's powers where the framers of the RTC did not so provide and to frustrate the exercise of Quartet's powers under the RTC. I think that might be an expression that the state of Belize has used as Quartet as an organ of the Caribbean community comprised of member ministers which has no means of resolving conflicting opinions on issues arising under another treaty and which are ultimately matters of foreign law, the jurisprudence of which is not at all analogous or common to the legal systems of member states' parties to the RTC would be in a, an inappropriate approach for this court to take. Turning to the last issue, which is to review the 2020 quota decision, Respectfully remind the court that this is an application for a claim for judicial review 
And this court has made it clear that the standard of review which applies to decisions such as that on the challenge is well settled. So for example, in the consultation judgment, the court run its dicta in the earlier TCL and CARICOM number two case referred to my learned friend and stated that applications to suspend the CT made pursuant to Article 83.3 D, F and G of the RTC, and this is the language of the court, allow quoted a broad discretion where the scope of judicial review is rather narrow. So if I could just repeat that, this court allows quoted a broad discretion where the scope of judicial review is rather narrow. The court is mindful that such decisions are invariably guided by an assessment of economic facts, trends and situations for which no firm standards exist. And it is not the role of the court to attempt to re-evaluate matters which were properly placed before quoted. Further, the court has made it clear that it is ultimately a matter of domestic economic policy, whether consistent with its development strategy, a member state wishes to promote the importation of extra regional cement or encourage local cement production, and if one or the other, what measures it should take. We can't do better than quoting the words of this honorable court in relation to the issues before the court today. Thus, the threshold for judicial intervention is high. It is not every alleged or perceived flaw in the decision-making process which will warrant the court's intervention. And even where the court intervenes, annulment of the decision in question does not follow automatically. We address next the claimant's allegations that the state breached its duty under Article 26 of the RTC to consult with the claimants prior to applying to quota to suspend the RTC and other allegations relating to the matters placed before quoted. We derive considerable assistance from the consultation judgment where we, we uh, extracted five core principles as to the nature and extent on the of the obligation on a member state to consult in respect of applications to quoted to suspend the CT. One, there's a duty on an applying state pursuant to Article 26 to consult the domestic import of the good under consideration prior to approaching quoted for suspension of the CT pursuant to Article 83. There is no obligation to consult a regional distributor, which is what the first claim on Rockard Distribution Limited is, and you will see that at paragraph 30 of the originating application at page 8 of the record. And interestingly, the first claimant, the solution company, did not assert any such right in the matter which gave rise to the consultation judgment, or indeed in the claim brought by Motula and Ramit Sons and Contracting Limited last year as the domestic importer into Trinidad and Tobago. So in our respectful submission, uh, we think that Mr. Maloney misspoke or perhaps didn't understand the word import. And when we said import into Trinidad and Tobago, he understood that to mean when he buys from Sonmez in Turkey and then consigns it to various companies in the region that somehow he imports in Trinidad and Tobago. That is not correct legally or factually, and there was no obligation in our respectful submission to consult with the supplier of cement outside of Trinidad and Tobago. The second uh, takeaway that we, we have from the consultation judgment is that in the absence of consultation by a member state, i.e. no consultation, quoted cannot look the other way, which is the language of the court, but ought reasonably to be concerned to discover whether the member state has notified or consulted with the importer prior to making its application and received all pertinent information about how the request could affect the importer. Three, the importance and value of the consultation process will vary from one case to another, and the intention of consulting under Article 26 is that Cote's decision-making process will, so far as is reasonable, be adequately informed by input from affected stakeholders. Four, where the application is made pursuant to 83.3 D, F, and G, the object and benefit of the consultation are limited namely to obtain information as to the impact of the suspension. And five, the particular grounds under 83, 3D, F, and G, as the language of the, of the provision makes clear, recognize and afford a wide discretion to policymakers. 
There is no dispute that the letters appended to the state's defense at TT7 at pages 1383 to 1407 of the record are those which were exchanged between the state and the second and third claimants in an attempt to solicit their views prior to the state's approach to Coated. Under cross-examination, Mr. Ramit accepted that the local companies were invited to submit written feedback and attend a consultation hosted by the Ministry of Trade, but declined to do so. And even though the consultation was postponed on two occasions to enable them to attend, they still did not participate. He also accepted that the very evidence which they have adduced before this court of the alleged detrimental impact of the 35% CT could have been submitted to the ministry to inform the decision that the ministry would make. We respectfully submit that the second and third claimants as domestic import and distributor of rock art cement respectively have sought to expand the duty on the state to consult. And it's interesting uh, that Mr. Ramit accepted that at all times they were acting on legal advice. They have sought to expand the duty on the state to consult beyond the limits of that which was determined by this court in the consultation judgment. Acting on legal advice in our respectful submission, they frustrated or obstructed the state's attempts to consult by unilaterally imposing conditions precedent to their participation and ultimately refusing to participate when their requests were not met. As this court has held in the case of SM Jalil, there is a duty of good faith imposed on persons who seek to enforce rights under the RTC. In our respectful submission, it was not open to the second and third claimants to seek to invoke a procedural right to be consulted, to unilaterally adopt actions which frustrated the exercise of that right, and then come to this court to complain that that right has been violated. In our respectful submission, this is behavior which this court should deprecate in strong terms, because if this is allowed uh, or permitted, I should say, Every few months, you will have an application to quoted complaining about some defect in the consultation process. In our respectful submission, that was not intended by either the CARICOM 2009 decision or the consultation judgment. What the court intended was to interpret Article 26 broadly to say the rule of law demands that if you're going to make decisions that may adversely affect these local importers, that you hear what they have to see so that it may inform your application to put it. It was not to give them a freestanding right to come to the court at the drop of a hat to complain that the state, you know, didn't give them enough time or the state didn't give them this bit of information that would have enabled them to make up a, a better contribution. The purpose and object of the consultation is to enable the state to make an informed decision when it makes an approach to quota. There was no duty on the state to comply, we say, with the revised procedures as part C thereof, which is intended to govern applications under 83, has not yet become operative, and that is D, F, and H. This was determined by this court in the consultation judgment where the very argument was raised against the state of Barbados and it remains binding precedent pursuant to Article 221. The claimants assert, based on the letter from Mr. Akbatur of Sonmez, that the depreciation of the lira had no impact on its cost, even though the letter itself is inaccurate as to when the depreciation started and is contradictory when he says on one hand it had no impact on the other that their costs have increased. Not, notably, Permanent Secretary Ovid did not accept that it followed that because Sonmez's business is denominated in U.S. dollars, that the depreciation would have had no impact on costs. And when you look at the, the language of the uh, application made by the state of Trinidad and Tobago to quoted, you will see that there was nothing unfair about the reference to the depreciation. And in any event, in our respectful submission, this had nothing to do with the, the local importers. It had to do with the, the, the producer, son, mares in Turkey. So how far is one going to take this duty of consultation if it is that we collect data, and this is a widely available, um, you know, on in, in public documents, as the, the, the state of the currency in, in Turkey, and we are obliged 
before we can make a, a request to Kuted to hear what they have to say on whether there is in fact a, a depreciation of the currency. In our respectful submission, uh, we reasonably expect that that is not what the court intended when it when it gave its its decision in the consultation judgment. In any event, the def the evidence of both Mr. Maloney and Mr. Ramit is that there were there were reductions in the cost of brocard cement in Trinidad and Tobago, and the invoices which Mr. Benjamin helpfully put to the permanent secretary, which you will find at pages three eight five three to three eight seven five reflected a unit reduction in price from 2019 to 2020 of approximately US $8 per metric ton. In other words, the price dropped. Whatever the reason, the undisputed evidence is that in 2020, CT being 35%, more rock hard cement was imported into Trinidad and Tobago than any previous year, and the price of rock hard cement either fell, according to us, or remained the same, according to Mr. Ramit, with the result of the 35% rate of duty in 2020 offered no protection to the domestic manufacturer TCL, bearing in mind that community policy recognized by this court says that where you have manufacturers, they are short a certain level of protection under the CT. And Mr. Ramit's evidence at paragraph 18 of his witness statement makes it clear that they developed their business to compete with TCL, the local manufacturer. So the evidence, and add on top of that, the evidence of the claimants that they intended to increase imports of rock hard cement by some 300% per annum post August 2020. Mr. Just Peter, a little word. Are we going to get Wrapping to up. Good. Thank you. The, just a short word on quota. The claimants have made reference to the decision of the state to register importers and impose a quota on imports of other hydraulic cement. But we say the claimants have chosen, as this court is aware, to litigate the legality of the quota in the domestic courts in a judicial review claim. And having elected to sue in that forum and pursue that claim on an urgent basis, they cannot now by a side when ask its court to pronounce upon it, particularly in circumstances where there's no doubt that the RTC makes provision for member states to impose quotas and other instruments of trade policy independently of quota. Justice Barrow, to conclude, notwithstanding all the evidence and the arguments placed before the court, we say that the case is a simple one. It is at its heart a judicial review challenge to the decision of quota in 2020 to grant approval to the state to suspend the CET and impose a duty of 50% on other hydraulic cement for one year. The jurisprudence of this court is that a decision of this nature is one which affords quota at a broad discretion and where the threshold for intervention is high. In our respectful submission, the claimants have not demonstrated that this decision was arrived at by an abuse of quota's discretionary power or that the state of Trinidad and Tobago obtained a suspension of the CET for an improper purpose or that the decision is so unconnected with the facts to be considered disproportionate. In fact, we submit that the evidence which has emerged in these proceedings demonstrate that there was ample basis for Kuta to act pursuant to articles 83D, F and H. And the court, as the court has recognized previously, it is not for it to descend into the minutiae of matters, which are ultimately matters of domestic economic policy. And while we had some vibrant exchanges yesterday between the bench, the bar, and the experts as to the relevance of WTO law to the question which is before the court, that is whether Coated was required to have regard to and determine whether the state complied with its obligations under GATT in the discharge of its functions under Artic Article 83, this court has already decided in Mary that its jurisdiction is limited to interpreting and applying the RTC. And therefore, however generous and purposes, purposive the court's approach to interpretation may be, this court's task remains one of interpreting the provisions of the RTC to which the contracting parties have agreed. It has no warrant to give effect to what they might or could in an ideal world have agreed to use the language in the Roma rights case. In the circumstances, we respectfully submit that the claim ought to be dismissed with costs to be paid to the state of Trinidad and Tobago, and those would be our respectful submissions unless there's anything further we can assist the 
quarter. And I very, thank you very much for your kind indulgence. Thank you, Ms. Would you allow me to ask um, a great risk maybe to me? I don't know, Mrs. Keith Vaughan. My question is short, and I hope her answer will also be short with your permission. Yeah, sure. The uh, consultancy decision of the court, as you, as you call it, your position is uh, not to take issue with the decision, but to submit that the arguments of the claimant are outside of what um, you identified five, you remember, five aspects of that decision are outside those five aspects. Am that I is correct. correct. That? Yes. yes, you are correct, Your Honor. That was a short answer to a short question. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, we now listen to Dr. Bob Shiva. May it please your honors. And before I begin, I would just like to say that this case has significant legal implications for CARICOM. The issue on our minds is whether this honorable court will interpret the provisions of the revised treaty of Shagaramas according to its purpose to protect the cement industry in Trinidad and Tobago, or whether it will interpret the revised Treaty of Shagaramas to protect the cement industry in Turkey. I now would like to begin by referring to a statement made by Prime Minister Motley last Monday at the University of the West Indies Vice Chancellor's Forum on sustainable island futures. Prime Minister Motley said, international organizations like the WTO that are formed, that refuse to accept that a one size fits all prescription does not work. And that countries such as ours that have a contribution to global trade in goods of 0.0000% and global trade in services of 0.0001% can do little to distort the global market and hence to impose rules on us that have led to the destruction of our indigenous manufacturing sector and capacity to have any form of industrialization have been a cruel and unusual cut by a world that simply does not see small states, does not hear small states, and is not prepared to treat to us until we become a crisis. The Caribbean community, as your honors are aware, is comprised of small states. The organization is governed by the revised Treaty of Shagaramas, which seeks to safeguard the indigenous manufacturing sectors of its member states and to build capacity so that its member states can have some form of industrialization and eventually be internationally competitive. In considering this case, the Caribbean community beseeches this honorable court to see small states, to hear small states, and to interpret the revised Treaty of Shagaramas in a manner that does not destroy their indigenous manufacturing sectors and their capacity to have any form of industrialization, whether it is in the area of cement or in any other area. Now the claimants are asking this court to declare the quoted decision authorizing the state of Trinidad and Tobago to suspend the CET on other hydraulic cement ultravirus, and that is in breach of the revised treaty of Shagaramas. The main argument of the claimants is that the quoted decision is ultra-virus because the revised Treaty of Shagaramas prohibits quoted from authorizing a member state to suspend the CET where the rate to be imposed is higher than its WTO bound rate. The Caribbean community submits that there is neither an express nor an implied prohibition in the revised Treaty of Shagaramas on quoted authorizing a member state to suspend 
the CET and to impose a rate higher than its bound rate. The Caribbean community respectfully submits that this decision, the quota decision, is intravirus the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. And before moving on to give the reasons why, this is really a case. If you speak about ultravirus, you're speaking about whether within the four corners of the revised treaty, there is an implied or express prohibition. If this was not a case about a prohibition in the treaty, then my learned friends would be saying that Quoted is authorized to do what it did, and then we wouldn't be here. So ultimately, regardless of how the question is phrased, it is really a question of whether there is this express or implied prohibition in the treaty. Now, these are the reasons why the CARICOM says that the COTED decision is intravirus. CARICOM is not a member of the WTO, and so it is not bound by WTO obligations. It is very important that the court bears in mind that CARICOM is a full juridical person. It is applying basically basic common law principles, the same as what the House of Lords said in Solomon and Solomon in 1897, when the House of Lords said the company is at law a different person altogether from the subscribers to the memorandum. We say CARICOM is at law a different person altogether from its member states. CARICOM is not a member of the WTO and therefore not bound by its provisions, although such provisions may be incorporated by reference into the revised treaty of Shagaramas and become part of the revised treaty of Shagaramas. And I will deal with these two elements briefly. With respect to not being bound by the provisions of the WTO agreements, the claimant's expert, Matthew Nicely, has told this court that CARICOM is not liable under WTO law for authorizing Trinidad and Tobago to suspend the CET to impose a tariff higher than its WTO bound rate. Why is CARICOM not liable? It is because CARICOM is not a member of the WTO and it has not assumed the powers and the obligations of its member states. Accordingly, CARICOM is not bound by the provisions of the agreement and cannot breach and has not breached the provisions of the WTO agreements. With respect to incorporation of WTO provisions in the RTC, and we have some examples. Some were mentioned by Mr. Justice Anderson yesterday when he referred to paragraph six of Article 116 of the revised treaty, which provides that no member state shall impose countervailing duties without prior authorization from COTED, and the determination and imposition of definitive countervailing duty shall be governed by the relevant provisions of the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. So in other words, a member state can impose provisional countervailing duties, but if that member state wants to impose definitive duties, it has to come to COTED and COTED will be governed by the, the provisions, the relevant provisions. So those provisions of the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures have been incorporated into the revised Treaty of Shagaramas. And the same can be said about Article 148, where paragraph two provides that disadvantaged countries shall accord to member states rights no more restrictive than those accorded to other parties of the WTO under the General Agreement on Trade in Services. So whatever provisions are, whatever the rights are, are deemed to be incorporated by reference into the revised Treaty of Shagaramas. But very importantly, your honors, the revised treaty does not incorporate by reference the GATT 1994 into Article 83. It is important to know that whereas relevant provisions of the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, as I've just indicated, have been incorporated by reference to paragraph six, the provisions of the WTO general agreement on tariffs and trade have not been incorporated in Article 
1983. Accordingly, the Caribbean community submits, respectfully submits, that in interpreting the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, the provisions of GATT 1994 are not among the provisions in the light of which this court is to review the legality of the quoted decision made under Article 83. As can the I court ask you, Dr. Bapshiva, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, in, in those areas where the, where the treaty, the revised treaty says that WTO uh, law needs to be followed. Now, we also heard that um, this law is transactional, flexible, hybrid. Um, is it possible for CARICOM to apply such, such uncertain law? Well, it is possible for CARICOM to apply the, the various provisions referred to in the treaty. But the uh -huh. difference between that and what we're dealing with now is that the court is now being asked to review the legality of a measure. So in light of that, the court has to take into account the fact that the nature and the structure of WTO agreements are such that they are not to be taken into, um, into, into account in terms of being used as a yardstick. And that mm -hmm. is because of you know, the various solutions available to members of the WTO to solve um, measures that are inconsistent with WTO agreements. Okay, so if a member state would, I'm not saying that that is the case here, but if a member state would uh, clearly be in breach of some WTO uh, rule, then CARICOM, if um, CARICOM could simply say, well, listen, uh, we think it's in, you're in breach, but it's your business. Um, we are not looking at that. Unless, unless your honor, it is a situation where the provisions have been incorporated okay. into the revised treaty. So Article 83 must be treated differently, um, that, tr differently from Article um, Article 116. Okay. So as the court said in the advisory opinion on Article 27.4 of the revised treaty, in answering the question that the community had posed, whether nationals of a state that opts out of a decision. Um, of a competent organ may nevertheless enjoy the benefits of that decision. The court said there is nothing in Article 27.4 to prevent them from doing so. The community asked the court to interpret Article 83 of the revised treaty in the same way. The claimants say that Coted was prohibited and we're at from authorizing the member state to suspend the CET to impose a tariff higher than its WTO bound rate. And we are asking this honorable court to hold that there is nothing, there is nothing, your honors, there is nothing in Article 83, nothing in Article 83 that prohibits Coted from authorizing a member state to suspend the CET to impose a, a tariff higher than its bound rate. Moreover, your honors, unlike chapter four of the revised treaty of Shagaramas, which contains a savings clause in, in article 62, there is no savings clause in chapter five of the revised treaty under which article 83 falls. Article 62 of chapter four it has a savings clause and it says the provisions of this chapter are without prejudice to obligations of the member states under existing international agreements. And we know they're talking about agreements at the time the treaty entered into force because we have assistance from the heading saying savings. So it's a savings clause. Your honors, there is nothing, so no savings clause in chapter five under which article 83 falls that states that those provisions are without prejudice to obligations of the member states under GATT 1994. This means that a decision of the quartet cannot be rendered ultra virus, that is unlawful on the ground that it prejudices the obligations of a member state under the GATT 1994. Accordingly, no member state 
exposing the claim of a community national or no community nationals such as the claimants can invoke the pre-existing obligations arising under the GATT 1994 as against the provisions of chapter five of the revised treaty of Shagaramas. Your Honours, I want to turn to one last issue. And that issue, Your Honours, concerns these WTO agreements and the settled position in the European Union. And with respect, we urge this honorable court to take the position of the, or to follow the precedent in the European Union, because it is good law. We heard yesterday from the claimant's own witness about the flexibility of WTO provisions. The general rule is, Your Honours, that the, as you are aware, WTO agreements are not in principle among the rules in the light of which the court is to review the legality of measures adopted by community organs. Community organs in the CARICOM context, community institutions in the European Un Union context. As stated in Portuguese Republic and the Council of Europe, it is for the court to review the legality of a community measure in the light of the WTO rules only where the community intended by means of that measure to implement a particular obligation assumed in the context of the WTO or where the measure expressly refers to the precise provisions of the WTO agreements. Thus, even if the Caribbean community were a member of the WTO, the court ought not to review the legality of the Cote decision in light of the GATT 1994, as the two exceptions are not applicable. The exceptions will be applicable if we were dealing with paragraph six of article 116, but we're not dealing with any provisions which expressly refer to WTO agreements. It is the general rule that is applicable here that the court, that the WTO agreements are not amongst those agreements that the court should use to review the legality of a community measure. Now the claimants in their reply to the written submissions of the of the second defendant have completely, completely, your honors, misunderstood the law in the European Union cases with respect to the rule that WTO agreements are not in principle among the rules in the light of which the court is to review the legality of measures adopted by community institutions. So at paragraph seven of their reply, they refer to the case of International Fruit Company, on which the community had relied for the general principle that the nature and structure of agreements mean that they're not capable of conferring rights or, or to be taken into account. The claimants uh, um, have submitted that the authority is in that. They refer to the case of Fedial as if to say, the case of International Fruit Company is bad law. But your honors, Fedial concerned a particular regulation which interpret, which when interpreted included the GATT. So it fell within the exceptions. This case is different. The fact that in the later case of Portuguese Republic and the Council of European Union, the court did not say International Fruit Company is bad law, but they cited the Fidial case as falling within the exceptions, which is different from our case. So there's no conflict between our case, the principle we're asking the court to apply, and the Fidial and the Fidial case. My learned friends also referred to European Commission and Hungary, and in essence um, stated that the the community, the CARICOM, has assumed the powers and obligations of the of the, its member states. That's simply not true. CARICOM does not sit in the WTO with, with all its member states mute and taking and taking and take decisions on behalf of its member states. It's, it's just simply not, not correct. My learned friends also refer to Article 84, which deals with the external um, this external trade policy, which states that where trade um, agreements involving tariff concessions are being 
negotiated, the prior approval of quartet shall be required. Well, the reason why the the prior approval, sorry, the prior approval is required is because CARICOM needs to ensure that a member state does not give concessions to a third state which undermine regional production. The fact that approval is required is no sort of evidence or basis on which one can conclude that the community has now assumed powers previously exercised by member states so as to make the WTO agreements binding on the Caribbean community and to give the court jurisdiction to review these agreements. At any rate, given the nature and structure of WTO agreements, even if this honorable court had jurisdiction to review them on the, on the authority of Portuguese Republic and the Council of Europe, these are not, the WTO agreements are not amongst the rules in the light of which the court would review the legality of the quoted decision. In wrapping up, I would just like to refer briefly to the fact that the claimants have alleged that the quoted decision is ultra-virus because it breaches an obligation that domestic importers shall be consulted prior to an application for authorization to suspend the CET being made and approved. They have also alleged that it's ultra-virus because it was made for improper purposes, that it is disproportionate, irrational, and unreasonable. And in this regard, your honors, the Caribbean community relies on its written submissions found at page 3904 to 3947 of the record. The Caribbean community requests that the court, this honorable court, um, dismiss the originating application and award costs to the community. And just one last thing the Caribbean community wishes to say before your honors ask questions, and that is that the court has a choice. It can interpret the revised Treaty of Chagarama so as to protect the cement manufacturing industry of Trinidad and Tobago and other small states in the Caribbean community, or it can interpret the revised treaty to protect the cement manufacturing industry of a third state. Your Honours, the Caribbean community submits that the law that it has submitted is sound law. With all due respect, the law submitted by the Caribbean community is sound law. And we urge this honorable court to attach significant weight to the, to the submissions of the Caribbean community. And the last thing is the Caribbean community urges this court to see small states, to hear small states, and to interpret the revised Treaty of Chagaramas according to its purpose so that our indigenous manufacturing sector does not become a crisis. Unless your honors um, wish to hear me further. Um, these are the submissions on behalf of the Caribbean community. I don't think I'm going to get off so easy, so I'll wait. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Thank you, um, General Counsel. I, I think as usual, you're right. Uh, so here we go. Um, thank you very much for those submissions. I I, um, I listened very attentively, of course, as, as um, that is my want, and um, I, I I heard what you said very clearly about the WTO and its relationship to CARICOM. Um, I wonder whether you could sort of opine, if if you are in a position to do so, on the conversation the bench had with um, Senior Counsel Mrs. Peak <clears throat> in relation to the uh, scope uh, of matters which are properly considered by quoted and by extension by this court, where a member state is making an application for the suspension of the CET. Uh, I think you were privy to that conversation. So I wonder if you could just <coughs> give us your view <coughs> as to how, for want of a better word, intrusive the inquiry um, could should be by quoted and by extension by the CCJ. Thanks. Um, Your Honor, is this inquiry with respect to the question of uh, other matters such as the um, WTO obligations, the boundary? Because um, no, no, I, I, I personally I heard you very clearly on what you said about that. No, I was I was wondering about 
aside from the WTO, the member state must, in fact, advance certain grounds, as I understand it, to justify the um, the application for the suspension. And uh, the question is, well, what kind of um, supervisory function does COTED perform in relation to that application? So does the member need to produce evidence, for example, of the critical shortfall in foreign exchange? Does it need to rationalize uh, why it is upping the CET uh, on the one hand, while it's imposing a quota on the other? Um, th those kinds, I I'm just very curious as to, as to what in the view of the community is the reach of um, of quoted in relation to these matters, and could I foreshadow another question I have in mind, which is that um, I I raised with Senior Counsel Benjamin the the issue of the resources available within quoted to consider the kinds of questions that he thought were appropriate for consideration by by quoted, and I think Mrs. Speak touched on this to some extent, but I'd also like your view as to whether you think there are the kinds of resources within, within, I'm sorry, within quoted to, um, sorry, to allow for the kind of review that um, Senior Council Benjamin appears to have in mind. Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Justice Anderson. I do understand the questions now. So in relation to evidence, I think the extent of evidence requires depends on the grounds that the that the member state is relying on. If the ground is critical shortfall of revenue, everyone knows, Coated knows, all the trade ministers, all the countries except Guyana did not grow last year. So there's no need to go to proof to, to prove that there is a critical shortfall. That, that information is widely available. It is in the public domain. If it was on a ground where it is not clear, then I think there would be an onus on the member state to provide more information so that co so that Coted is convinced that really a suspension is required on that particular ground. Um, with respect to the quota, um, I do not think, in my opinion, member states do not have to bring before quoted all the economic measures they intend to take in any particular year to deal with the shortfall. The question was um, posed um, whether while on the one hand you raise taxes to increase revenue and on the other you impose a quota which will which will reduce this sort of revenue, but that's from that particular entity. Remember the grounds that the application, um, the application is based on not only that there is a critical shortfall of revenue, it is also based on supporting local industry. So if Trinidad and Tobago focuses so much or, or focuses solely on one thing, they may neglect the other. So although you could see a difference, when you look at the grounds, you, you also see that difference. A need to protect um, or support local industry as well as to deal with a critical shortfall of revenue. And it doesn't matter um, that where what caused that critical shortfall of revenue. Yesterday, my learned friend Benjamin, um, you know, sought to juice evidence about the gas and the oil prices. It doesn't matter whether it was caused by, by a lack of gas or oil or kerosene. What matters is that there is in fact a shortfall, a critical shortfall of revenue. And this is a measure that a member state is taking in an effort to reduce the, the shortfall. And you, you've asked, your honor has asked, about the resources, whether we have resources to go into Sorry, it. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, I apologize, my mic was was muted. Before we go to the second um, question, just a little bit more on the first. Um, now, Trinidad and Tobago produced um, statements in its defense, which um, spoke to, for example, the level of employment that the local cement manufacturer um, was able to secure. Uh, I think it also spoke to the issue of foreign exchange 
generated by the local cement uh, manufacturer. Um, now, if, and this is, I beg your pardon for doing this, but this is purely hypothetical. If, um, if the, the claimants had been able to show that they were able to generate more employment and were able to earn more foreign exchange than the local cement manufacturer, um, again, and I'm asking for your indulgence, um, would, would this, would this be something that quoted would say, but look, you know, you are asking for protection for the local manufacturer, but on the documents presented, um, we are seeing here that the other side is, is more productive in terms of uh, employment and foreign exchange and so on. Is, is that something that quoted will go into or is just too intrusive? It would not consider that kind of analysis at all. Your Honor, it is something that quoted should not consider if right. it does not want to be uh, brought before this court for acting ultra-virus. This treaty is primarily about the region and allowing, for example, in this context, the regional production to increase. It is not about protecting the cement industry in Turkey. Unfortunately, what the claimants are doing or what the claimants asking this court to do has the effect of undermining the objective of the community, which is to safeguard regional production. I know that the, your honors um, do not always like to hear this. I was trying to make this point in the Barbados case. There is no obligation under, under the treaty for community nationals to act in furtherance of the objectives of the community. And though a community national may be granted special leave, the special leave really should not be to further or to prejudice the objectives of the community. The objective of the community is not to safeguard cement in Turkey. The primary objective, if you have two competing objectives, the primary objective is to safeguard the production, safeguard production in the region. Production in Turkey undermines production in, in the region. So the, the treaty should be interpreted so as to do that. Yes, so I, I, yeah. we really shouldn't be looking at that. It matters not what they can do. The, the, the end result is whether we want to admit it or not, is that they would decimate the local industry. Then what incentive is there for other local companies or, or other entrepreneurs to want to develop a manufacturing industry if the door is left open for third states to bring in to, for their own community nationals to set up companies to facilitate third states to bring in products which destroy the very purpose of, 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 of the treaty. Thank you. I don't want to prolong it too much, but um, I, I was hoping for, uh, you see, I'm, I'm very interested in the question as to how intrusive the inquiry could be. And of course, I'm not offering an opinion one way or the other. I'm just very curious on, on the general question. Uh, so that if we forget for the moment the importer of cement from Turkey, and they're just concerned, let us say too, um, you know, local producers, for example, um, is a level of intrusion by quoted such that it can inquire into actions that the government might take to protect one versus another, or is that simply a matter for domestic national economic policy and, and the quota is not to interfere at all in relation to that. Your, Your Honor, I think that quota can interfere, can ask questions so as to satisfy its minds as, as to whether the grounds set out have been fulfilled so that they're not simply authorizing a member state to suspend the CET when really they do not, the member state does not satisfy the criteria. Yep. So they need go no further, only enough to be satisfied. Yeah, thank you. And the second question. Oh, sorry, can you repeat? The second I, question had to do with resources. I was I was asking Mr. Benjamin because he he um he had a very uh, interesting take on the kinds of issues that um, should be disclosed to and therefore I assume considered by quoted. 
And I, I wondered whether Cote had the kind of resources to respond in the way that he he wanted. Of course, he posed it in a sense as a challenge to uh, improving the level and quality of our decision making, etc. So uh, I just wanted your response. I think we had one from Mrs. Speak, but your, your response to that issue. Thanks. Yes, um, your honors. So, well, Coted does not have the resources to answer the sort of questions, but that's really um, with respect, um, not relevant because the sort of questions um, my learned friend would like the quoted to consider are questions that are not not fitting for an organization that is not a member of the WTO. If we were dealing with the EU, then the question of whether a member state is acting in compliance with the WTO obligations may be a relevant consideration. But when there is no express or neither an express nor an implied prohibition on quoted authorizing a member state to suspend the CET, even when to do so would, would be to impose a rate higher than the WTO bound rate. Quoted has no place asking those questions in the first place, even if Quoted had all the resources. That is not Quoted's business. And Quoted could properly be sued because if the member state um, does not answer the question or, or provide the information, that same member state can turn around and sue Quoted for taking into account or trying to take into account irrelevant considerations. So we go straight back to the four corners of the treaty. We analyze the treaty, we ask ourselves, is there a prohibition? And with all due respect, the Caribbean community submits there's no prohibition. And we're not just saying that because this is our case. We're saying that because we believe we believe it is sound law. Thank you very much, General Constantine. Uh, President, with your leave, may I ask um, Dr. Barish a first question, please? Uh, Dr. Barish, um, has it ever happened that the court had um, refused uh, an application like this one, an application for suspension of the CET and um, to re to allow um, the member state uh, to require an import duty higher than the CET has that does that happen? Your Honour, so I've searched the record to see what has transpired since the protocol to amend Article 83 has been a provision it was provisionally applied because this only happened since 2015. Those other yeah. grounds were not part of the original um, Article 83. And according to our records, this is the very first time that it, it appears from the records, this is the very first time that Coted has been made aware or that Coted is aware to the best of my knowledge that the bound rate is high, that the bound WTO bound rate of the member state is higher than that um, which they are authorizing, sorry, it's lower than that which they're authorizing the member state to impose. So this looks like the first time. Yeah, but my question was, uh, 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 apart from bound rates, um, I suppose Coted gets, well, I'm sure Coted gets a lot of application from member states to suspend CET and allow the state to uh, to apply a higher rate than the CET, certainly after 2015. I think the cases before that was to be allowed to to Im to impose a duty below the CET. Uh, since 2014-15, uh, it's now also allowed to to require a higher uh, rate. Um, has it ever happened that uh, that these kind of applications have been refused by Cotet? Um, not to my not to my knowledge, Your Honours. Not to my no. knowledge, this is, is, we haven't seen that in the records. Um, we have searched when we were looking at this issue of customary international law mm -hmm. to see, you know, whether there is precedent, whether you could really say, you know, that this is settled law. And this seems as if it's the first time, to the best of my knowledge, that the rate to be imposed is higher than the WTO boundary. 
And this would not have happened, Your Honor, if Trinidad had not made an error with respect to the classification of cement, because there's no way that Trinidad would have bound the cement bound. Um, it's it's bound, has have a WTO bound rate of five percent if it knew that the cement that was being manufactured could be other hydraulic um, cement. So this is an error. Yeah, yeah, but okay. My question was not especially uh, with respect to the bound rate of the WTO. Uh, an application for a CET high uh, for a for a suspension of the CET, uh, CET and um, to allow the state just to uh, Eric, to impose an import duty above the CET. Not uh, nothing to do with the bound rate. Uh, this is the first time that the bound rate is mentioned, but simply I want the suspension of the CET because I want to put a higher import duty. Those kind of applications have, yes. they have been refused. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, well, um, have they been refused? I'm here thinking, I know the ones for the lower rate. Um, the question would be, you know, whether member states can supply, but in relation to the higher rate, I know that applications have been granted. I cannot, you know, I cannot think of any specific one where it's been refused, but I imagine, oh, I think recently, recently we had a case where the revised procedures were not complied with, and we told the member state that it could not um, be authorized to suspend the CET. So, so this was one which happened, I think, very recently at the maybe at the 51st um, quartet. Yes, it was refused, but the ground for refusal was a basis was on the basis of lack of any evidence of consultation, and and the particular member state had not submitted the appropriate revised procedure forms. So okay. yes, the thinking. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't have any further questions. Only to say that I was kind of disappointed that none of the attorneys have dared to pronounce the International Fruit Company case in its full, <laughs> because it's the International Fruit Company against the Productschap for Groenten and Fruit. Oh. I would have loved uh, uh, one of the lawyers pronouncing that one. But anyway, <laughs> apart from that, thank you very much. Yes, much obliged to the court. Um, so thank you. Um, I think we can now proceed to Mr. Jeremy uh, to ask him. Um, he already announced that he would keep it short, um, but nevertheless, uh, of course, um, he. Um, Justice Jamada, do you have any questions? Or let me see. He appears to be frozen. Um, yes. Let me see what I can get him. Even though he has a warm personality, he looks frozen. Um, so I think I made a mistake. I think the first one to speak now is uh, Mrs. Matut. Um, but we want to get Justice Jamila back before we proceed. Madam Deputy, you have to tell me when Justice Jamila is back. He has lost connection. He's trying to get back in. Perhaps, Josh, you may you may wish to take a break now, if it's possible, because he he has been trying to get to get back in. Okay. Well, um, we will take a very short break. As soon as he's back, Mrs. Matut, uh, you will be. Uh, uh, you can can address us. Um, I I I understand that you will be short too. Excellent. Yes, please, so we yeah. just take 
We take a few minutes break. As soon as Justice Jamada is back in the fold, we will continue. And Madam uh, Deputy, you will you will give us a, a signal that it is uh, when he is back. Certainly, Judge. Thank you.
Council and members of the bench, we are about to resume. Um, Honorable Mr. Justice Witt will make an announcement. Yes, it it appears that uh, Mr. Justice Jamanda lost his entire internet at the moment. So um, the proposition is that uh, the proposal is that um, he, he, he will simply not be able to follow us directly live. Uh, but uh, of course, everything that is is said has been said and is going to be said is recorded. So he uh, will uh, he will look at the recording as soon as he can, so that he is au fait with uh, with everything that has been said. There is no other way unless we have to um, adjourn and come back some other day. But I don't think that that uh, would be um, efficient unless there is anyone who has a problem with this proposition, then we just continue um, in the state that we are. Will he be so, listening, um, Chair? Will he be listening um, on telephone? Well, apparently he doesn't have a Teams on his telephone. So even that is difficult. Um, Anyway, the, um, so he, he suggested um, that what he could do is listen to the recording of what will follow from now. So no, but sorry, could, could we follow up with what Justice Barr just asked? Is, is there no other way in which a judge could have access to the simultaneous happenings in the court? Surely, I, um, if, if, I, if I may interrupt um, Justice Anderson, um, I would be happy to connect with him on WhatsApp uh -huh. and in fact use the video feature of my WhatsApp so that he can see the screen as well as hear what is taking place and in fact um, make his intervention. Great. Um, shall we, um, well, uh, maybe best thing is that you try now to do that to get that connection and then we can continue. And whilst he's trying that, maybe the our IT persons could put their minds to work in terms of trying to find a way to integrate our brother into the hearing. Correct. I must congratulate um, our brother president, as you would, I am sure, uh, on the fact that he is so au fait with the technology that he's able to offer a solution in circumstances where apparently our IT people I uh, find it difficult to offer a solution. Justice Barra, please take a bow, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy you said that, Justice Anderson, because I was about to recommend the old fashioned way, which was a simple telephone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and a landline at that, <laughs> because he has no internet. But we'll see what Justice Barrow comes up with, as resourceful as he is. As as young people would tell me, we are using data and not um, internet for the WhatsApp. But he has not, he has not answered. Judge, I will I will I will try to call him again. Uh, we are having Ayinde from IT call him so that he can do the download of Teams on his phone. We will see how that can work. But the suggestions from your honours, uh, uh, we welcome them. They, those ask, are the ones that ask, I uh, ask um, Justice Jamadar. Oh, all right. So Kurt, Kurt, Kurt is suggesting to me that his internet is done, so his WhatsApp is also off. Okay. So then, in, in maybe case, we get back to the old-fashioned telephone. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, just give us a. Uh, um, a few more minutes to see if we can get him online, so to speak, um, so that he can listen in at least. I'll, I'll call him now, Judge. Thank you. Yes. So I'll. Well, he, he can adjust. also. Uh, President, yeah? I presume if, if he's able to hear, he could also make whatever interventions he wishes, surely. I, 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 I assume. Yes. So I think it's I think it's very important that we um we, we seek his his integration into the process now. Yes, of course. Um, 
so what was first suggested is the very last resort, the ultimum remedium, as uh, lawyers say. I guess, President, it calls for some flexibility. Yes. Uh, well, maybe Mr. Benjamin might have other adjectives he could put in at this point. <laughs> um, Your Honours, I am seriously considering whether or not it might be fairer to take the adjournment now and simply resume in the morning. No, um, I seem yeah. to recall, not to interrupt counsel, but I seem to recall during the pre-trial uh, phase that yes. at least one attorney indicated unavailability on the 30th. I could be wrong. Well, in fact, I am one such attorney, but I will make other arrangements if I have to. Um, unfortunately, my, Your Honours, I am embarrassed tomorrow, and I cannot meet other arrangements. And so okay. there, there will be several of the judges who will not be able to sit tomorrow. So we have to, um, uh, we have to find a solution um, to continue sure, now. Sure, sure. May, I, may I invite you to... Um, postpone the hearing for half an hour, and I'm sure that in half an hour, he can get teams on this phone. Okay, that would be a, uh, yeah, if... Uh, half, half, half an hour should certainly do it, um, Chair. Yeah, um, um, I'm not so, I'm not so familiar with these, uh, um, with telephones, as you know, but um, um, I am happy to, uh, to wait half, 15 minutes, I Justice, but what is your what is your what is your solution? Well, the solution, or at least the, the the proposal, is that we wait half an hour, maybe fifteen minutes, as long as it takes for Justice Jamada to get teams on his phone, and then he could be with us through his phone. Okay. Okay. So okay. let me let. Um, I'm not quite sure how long it takes. Let's say. Um, we take 15 minutes. If it has to take longer, then you will announce a somewhat longer, uh, a longer adjournment because we have to, we have to finish this today. Yes, uh, yes. President, is it possible for us uh, as a bench to meet um, separately uh, outside yeah. of this setting? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, um, Mr. De Silva will get us on another, on another uh, platform. So Just we adjourn. Yes. Um, Justice Jamal, I heard everything you you you, you uh, on the bench said because I I have him on phone and he's close to the speaker. Uh -huh. Is that is that is that a solution that you think can work? Um, if he doesn't get the teams on his phone, because he's right here, he's hearing everything that has been said. He heard. Yeah. He hears everything. Are you uh, hearing? I I'm here, Justice Witt. Are you hearing okay. him, Judge? Yes, I'm hearing him. And um, so in, in, if he has a question, just indicate it to you and then you will tell us that he has a question and then he can ask the question. So would, it, would that... Question. No, not at the moment, but you might have one. <laughs> Knowing you... <laughs> no, I will have no questions. I will just listen. So let's go back and start. Okay, but don't be... Uh, don't be uh, <laughs> afraid to ask questions if you really think it's necessary to do so. So we, can we would not want we would not want Ms. Matut or Mr. Jeremy to feel that they were in fact neglected by you and not having any probes issued to them by you. Just I will rely on you there in particular. Good. So Justice uh, Anderson, did you still want a side side uh, meeting? Uh, no, 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 this is now fine. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Rajnavli. Good. So then we can continue on this footing uh, unless somebody has serious objections, which I don't hope. So if not, Ms. Matut. I'm trying to see if it comes back up, right? Once it comes back up, I will join, obviously. Yeah, okay. Yes, Ms. Matut, you may address us. Thank you, Your Honor. Sorry, you, you, you can join now? Sorry.
let's wait and see if that happens then. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Right. You're back. Justice Jamada, you're back. I in have the I have returned from the void, yes. That is very good. Like Jonah returning Another. from the void. Thank you. Right. Until so, the camera gets my... until the camera gets sorted out. Okay, I think it's gotten sorted out. So Okay, but we can hear you, you can hear us, um, and even you can ask questions if uh, if that is necessary. I had a question for uh, Dr. Bab Schaefer. Is she still available to be asked a question or not? If I can find my question. Yes, I think she, she is still here, so um, <laughs> bear with us, Ms. Matut. Uh, let's Go back to Dr. Bob Schaefer. There is another question for you. Yes, Justice Jomada. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Bob Schaefer, I just want to ask uh, a very um, short question, I hope. In the 51st report, the, it is noted that Trinidad applied under Article 83.3 and on three grounds, E, F, and G. Agreed? I'm here honest. They applied on three grounds. I would just have to double I'm check. I'm looking at the report. I'm looking at yes. your report. Yes, report, on three paragraph grounds. Paragraph two says the Minister of Trade and Industry increased from five to 50 for the period 1 January to 31st December 2021 in accordance with Article 83. Three subparagraphs D, F and G. Yes, Three? it's familiar. Right. When we go to the end of that report, we have at the very end the decision. You have that? Which page of the record, Your Honor? Uh, page 349 and 350. It's the end of the report. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. I have you the have report. It? Yes. You have the last. Two. Can you go to the end of it, the decision? Yes, Your Honor. Right. So my question is, on does the decision disclose which of those grounds it was based on? The the decision itself doesn't state that, but it is evident from the report attached to the decision. Um, this honourable court um, has held that once you know the reasons for the decision can be ascertainable, that would suffice. So, notwithstanding that the actual decision. Um, does not specify the three grounds. The application was made on the three grounds as shown in the attached report. Right, yes, oh, I see that. So then is it then to be assumed that in a report like this, it was granted on all three grounds? Because on remember in your evidence you said earlier, I'm asking this for this reason, remember you said earlier that a uh, member state may make an application on any number of grounds, and Mrs. Peake has submitted to us, that it matters not whether you meet either the evidential or the legal requirements of all the grounds as long as you satisfy one. Agreed? Um, right. Yes. It, so, so my question is, in a case like this, where the report on the face of it doesn't say, it says the grounds that were, were the basis of the application, but it doesn't, for example, say that, and whereas the quartet is satisfied that the requirements of 
um, 83, 3D or G have been satisfied or whatever. Um, it doesn't say that so that the, the little predicament for a reviewing body is when it looks at the decision, if we're going to talk about virus or ultraviolet or whatever other the grounds may be or what evidence is relevant and so on and so on and so on, then which of the grounds on the face of it were the basis or bases for the decision? Yes. Or is it to be assumed that all three? How, how, how do you help us with that? Okay, so um, I was present. I, I can't give evidence. Um, what, what I would say is that it is on all three grounds. Right. And that in light of the question which your honor has raised, um, in the future, quota decisions would have to be drafted um, differently. Um, the member state, Trinidad and Tobago, provided um, evidence or spoke about all three grounds. So there is um, in its application, there's information um, to to justify each of the three, each of the Fair three. And, and, the and, moving, and moving forward, I, I mean, it's not for me to tell you all what to do. I think that could be helpful uh, because, for example, if you notice in your decision, you have been careful with recitals, noting what the case was. And you also, I suppose, in light of our decision, um, considering that the uh, competent authority has undertaken consultations. So that it, for me, it would have been helpful if I, for example, saw a recital, as you have suggested, would say, and on evidence brought before, and this is not, I'm not trying to be prescriptive, uh, which supports ground whichever ones, if the decision is made. You know what I mean? Yes, Your Honor. I, I understand um, perfectly. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be in any way. Um, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm, I was just asking as a question of information because of the submissions made to us by both Mrs. Peak and yourself that if you come on many grounds but satisfy one, that is sufficient. And so when I looked at the decision part of the report, I was unable to discover which of the all of the grounds was the basis of this decision. Now, this is a little more technical, but I think I need to put it to you. Is that of any consequence for a reviewing body that the the decision maker has not revealed, at least in the in this document, on the face of it, the actual basis for the decision. Um, no, no, Your Honor. Um, what the Caribbean community um, submits in relation to your question is that this the report itself does not contain any sort of evidence to suggest that 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 the suspension um, was not granted on any particular ground. Um, I do take your your point, um, but it would be unfortunate if due to a failure of the decision to have been drafted differently by the conference staff person, um, that there's such a drastic consequence. Um, I don't know if your honors want the community to provide evidence, if you want us to file a document to show that the, the decision was granted on the three grounds. Um, I can do that if your honors require it. Um, but what I would say is that the report taken in conjunction with the decision indicates that the read together indicates that the that the decision was granted on all three grounds. There's nothing to the contrary to suggest otherwise. I, okay, I you, would go, you would go so far, General Counsel, as to suggest that there is not any indication that any of the grounds was disallowed. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Much obliged. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bob Schaefer. And uh, then we now can continue with uh, Ms. Matut on behalf of the state of Belize. Good afternoon, thank you, Your Honor. 
Um, the state of Belize relies on its written submissions that have been filed um, in these proceedings. However, we have provided the court as well as the parties with speaking note. And as such, we intend to use that for the matters now. If I may begin. Sure. Belize associates with and adopts as its own arguments of that of the defendants and the other intervener. And we ask that the claim be dismissed for the reasons that they have given and will be given by the other intervener. For not wanting to sound repetitive based on the submissions that have already been made by Council for Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the CARICOM Secretariat, we still wish to reiterate and emphasize some of the points that have been made for the court to consider when making its determination in this matter. So for us, the first point will be whether in fact the WTO point is misconceived. Article 83 of the revised Treaty of Chagaramas sets out the exhaustive, exhaustive list of factors to be considered by quoted when deciding an application by a member state to suspend the common external tariff. Compliance with international agreements, GATT, WTO, or otherwise, is not one of them. To consider and apply such agreements or to determine breaches thereof would be ultra vires by the quoted. The jurisdiction of the court is in fact limited to the interpretation and application of the revised treaty. And to vitiate the quoted decision on the basis that it authorized the first defendant to apply a tariff rate on cement that is higher than its bond rate requires the, this court to determine that the first defendant's WTO obligations and agreement precludes this and there was a breach thereof and that quoted was due to bound to refuse, refuse the application in favor of the WTO agreement and law. With respect, your honors, the first intervener submits that this honorable court has no jurisdiction to make such a finding. And as such, the WTO objection is in fact misconceived. On the point of consultation, your honor, with respect, this, the first intervener submits that this point as well fails. The forms prepared by quoted for an application to suspend the CET requires evidence of consultation. Once there is evidence before the quoted that consultation has in fact taken place, it is not open to quoted to refuse an application merely on the ground that the quality or the extent of the consultation was insufficient. Further, it is submitted that this honorable court has no jurisdiction to quash a quoted decision on the ground only that the quality or extent of the consultation was in fact insufficient. If there is absolutely no consultation, then the court may intervene. And this was established in the rock hard cement case against the state of Barbados 2020. The first intervener further submits with respect that a consultation by a member state prior to deciding whether to apply a suspension of the CET is in fact a domestic law issue, which may be judicially reviewed in a domestic court. Belize contends that if a member state holds consultation and decides to apply to quoted or not to apply to quoted, does not engage the revised treaty. A CARICOM national affected by such a decision by a member state, either way, cannot apply to this honorable court to judicially review such a decision. It can, of course, apply to its domestic court. The first intervener's primary position is to urge this honorable court not to interrogate the extent of the consultation carried out by the first defendant in this case. 
as the evidence has proven that consultations did in fact take place. Nevertheless, in the case at bar, the evidence is clear. Claimants were afforded a fair opportunity to make representations on whether the first defendant should make an application to Putin to suspend the CT for the period 2021. But what the evidence had, has revealed is that the claimants declined to participate in the process. At its meeting, Quoted was satisfied that there was evidence that consultation had in fact taken place. In this light of their conduct, there is absolutely no basis on which the claimants can properly complain about the lack of or insufficient consultation by the first defendant and as such, Quoted's decision should not be vitiated on this ground. Is there sufficient or was there sufficient evidence placed before Quoted? The first intervener invites this court to review the written application that has been filed or that was filed by the first defendant to Quoted and to test it against Article 83. On our review of the application, the court will conclude quite easily, we submit, that there was in fact sufficient evidence produced by the defendants to satisfy the criteria as set out in Article 83 of the revised treaty. There was evidence of a critical shortfall in government revenue before quoted. It is in fact indisputable that the first defendant placed evidence before quoted that cement is of strategic importance to the econo economic development of the first defendant. And finally, the evidence was compelling that there was need to support the cement industry in the first defendant. Respectfully, it is important for the court to hold that for the purposes of the treaty, the cement industry in the first defendant, that is Trinidad and Tobago, is that of the sole domestic producer of cement in the form of the company Trinidad Cement Limited, importation of cheap cement is not an industry for the purposes of the revised treaty. Has quoted properly exercised its jurisdiction? The court is invited to closely review the report of the quoted meeting. On a review, the court will find that quoted did not carry out a prefunctory review of the first defendant's application. In fact, the record reveals that ministers carefully evaluated the evidence before it and took advice from CARICOM's general counsel. In the present circumstances, it cannot be credibly contended that Quoted did not reasonably and properly exercise its discretion. To the extent that there was evidence which satisfied three of the criteria as set out in Article 83 of the revised treaty, this court cannot, with respect, set aside Quoted's decision and substitute its own finding. The court is respectfully reminded that Quoted is comprised of ministers. It is not a judicial or quasi-judicial body. Whilst it must act fairly and on the evidence before it, its decision is to be judicially reviewed, bearing in mind that it is designed to make a policy decision based on the evidence before it and considering the provisions stated in Article 83 only. On the point of bad faith, the claimants are CARICOM nationals. They are not producers of cement. Sorry, they are not producers of cement. They are merely importers and distributors. This, yes, affords them certain rights under the revised treaty, but none of those rights are engaged or impaired in the case at bar. The claimant's right to import cement into Trinidad and Tobago remains secure, but like all other importers, it is subject to the prevailing tariff. The claimant's qua importers are granted no right to import goods by the revised treaty. 
it is submitted with respect that Article 78 of the revised treaty, when properly construed, does not does create a right to import goods from outside the community. However, it must be interpreted and applied with the other provisions of the RTC, including Article 83, which affords the first defendant the right to apply to suspend the CT and to impose a tariff that is higher. As such, we say the primary question is whether there is evidence of bad faith in this case. And for the first intervener, that answer is no. Belize then submits that the first defendant openly invited the claimants to participate in the consultation exercise. And we say that this weighs heavily against the conclusion of bad faith. Further, the application to quote it was in fact evidence-based. It was credible and it was in compliance with Article 83 of the revised treaty. The notion that the increase in tariff was targeted at the claimants is simply not born out of the evidence. As such, we humbly submit that for this court to find bad faith, the claimants had to prove that there was more than a mere violation to the revised treaty to support this conclusion, and they have in fact failed to do so. As such, in conclusion, the first intervener respectfully submits that this claim is a paradigm example of how the suspension mechanism designed by the revised treaty should work. Belize submits that the evidence produced by the first defendant was sufficient and the process adopted by the defendants in this case in considering the application was in fact treaty compliant. The grounds relied on by the claimants are unavailing. As such, Belize respectfully submits that this claim should be dismissed with costs to the defendants. Your honors, those would be the submissions of the first intervener unless there are questions. Thank you. I have no questions, but if there are questions from my colleagues, um, I don't think so. So thank you very much. Um, I think we now turn to Mr. Jeremy uh, on behalf of the second intervener, TCL. Yes. <clears throat> Your Honor, just in terms of managing my time, can you give me an idea of how much time I have? Well, let us let let you give us an idea how much time you think you need. Well, I did see some of it, and I did see that I will produce a something in writing for you. Um, would half an hour be okay, or would that be pressing? Yeah, you will, well, you officially have forty-five minutes, but um, if you want to compress it in in half an hour, I think you can. But um, then that that would be fine. Okay, thank you. We will take you, Mr. Jeremy, as having given up some of your time to Mrs. Speak. I, but I did, and I'm a man I, of I, my word. That, 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 so that's exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> we will take we will take that pound of flesh. Okay. Um, Your Honor, <laughs> may I just inquire because I I wasn't sure that I heard Mr. Jeremy correctly. Is he suggesting that he is going to provide a written submission afterwards, or he has provided it because we haven't seen it in the email? No, what I said is that like the first intervener who's, who truncated his, his time, I would do a speaking note, which I would endeavor to, to file at the earliest possible opportunity, perhaps tonight, if, if, you look, if your honors wish that, or tomorrow morning, if I can be bold enough to ask for that. Well, if the speaking note doesn't add anything to what you say, then that would be all right, I suppose, but not if it adds something new, because then, of course, the other side of would course. want of course. to react. Yeah, on, on, the, on the other hand, uh, Mr. Jeremy, with the greatest of respect, uh, my understanding of a speaking note is that it is to help the bench to enable you to make your submissions flowingly knowing that the bench does not have to take a note of what you're saying because there is already 
the speaking note. Therefore, if you do not have that for our use while you are speaking, then the purpose of the speaking note is not served, one, and two, it raises the potential of discomfort at a minimum on the part of Mr. Benjamin and perhaps others. So it may be better, since you did not have the time to give it to us beforehand, to leave those speaking notes alone in my own personal view. Yes, I, I think so. I think I, I, um, um, uh, I, I, I agree with that because it, it, it can create uh, all kind of issues. So we, we prefer you to speak and then leave it at that. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Your Honor, I do not propose to dig a trench under the arguments made by the state, the community, and the first intervener. So, we adopt those submissions and principles articulated by Council in respect of the above parties. Now, the second intervener says that there's a reason that it is an affected party, an obvious reason, in the claim that Rockhard brings. And that is that there is an obvious and adverse potential impact, which any finding against the state slash quoted will have on us. We engage with the consultation process throughout on the evidence and in good faith. The evidence before us is that we are in the sort of crisis that Dr. Bob Schaefer warned against, that if there's a negative finding here, that will ruin us in the current climate. And uh, I just wish to refer you, Lord, your honors, to the affidavit in opposition to the interim measures of Guillermo Rojo, which is at page 163 of the record, because there is evidence there which is evergreen. It, it, it is not restricted to the, to the interim measures. And in particular, if you look at paragraph 13 of that affidavit, which is page 1683 of the record, we see that our business is at the point if we have to become an importer of, of cement, as, as Rockham has the luxury of being, our employee base will move from 315 to 15, our contractors will move from 462 to 15, and our injections of approximately 6 million US dollars every year will be, we don't give a figure, but we say that that will be significantly affected, and our forex earnings, which are now in the vicinity of 240 million TT, will cease. Now, all of that, of course, will have disastrous effects for us, given the current economic climate. Now, the claimants neglected to, as we did, and upon invitation, and this is on the uncontradicted evidence before us, engage in the consultation process with the state, Trinidad and Tobago, which preceded the suspension of the CT and the adoption of the 50% rate. That the protection afforded to us as a local supplier, paying taxes, employing persons, contributing fully to the integrated domestic economy, with linkages to the society, should be stripped of that protection which we have which we have engaged in and, and sought, when we have done all that we can to participate fully 
and to seek the very reliefs that we have not been provided, and those reliefs could be swept away from us on the basis of what I have heard would be a cruel twist indeed. I'm not, I, I've left, of course, without adding to it, the comments that Ms. Peek and her witnesses have made as to the effects, the very real effects, which the state of Trinidad and Tobago will feel almost immediately. Your Honours, on the law, we say that the following four points of general principle are straightforward and ought to be on controversial. As four points. One, that the previous decisions of this court constitute stare decisis on most, if not all, of the issues raised by the claimants herein. So that the claimants are bound unless they can distinguish those decisions. That's one. Two, we say that it, it is also uncontroversial that the, the, the state of Trinidad and Tobago must be afforded sufficient policy space as previously decided in related proceedings to achieve its economic objectives. That's a point that is articulated by Ms. Peek, spoken to by Ms. Bob Schaefer, and which I will only touch on. We say three, that the consultation mechanism adopted by the state is fair and adequate, having regard to the previous decisions of this court. In that meaningful engagement with the payments was sought as it was with us. With, uh, with us, of course, that invitation was accepted. We, we participated fully. The payments did not. And we say fourth, and we, we say that this should as well be a general principle that is uncontroversial. That this honorable court with respect should have no jurisdiction to determine the what I would call the WTO issue. But even if it were to consider that, the claimant's arguments cannot be maintained because there's been no determination by the dispute resolution body that there was any breach of the GATT WTO treaty obligations by the state of Trinidad and Tobago. And that as the witness, the expert pointed to yesterday, there is an entire mode of vivendi which might result in a, a completely different result to one which this court might, however hesitantly, arrive at. Your Honor, TCL does not repeat the propositions of law, which we have cited at paragraph 10 of our written submissions, and that's at page 5063 to 5070 of the record. We submit the following five propositions, which we see as settled community law. One, that the CT, CSME regime exists, at least in part, to facilitate the production of regional goods and to discourage the importation of extra regional goods. Two, we say that a member state is entitled to apply for a suspension of its CT rate on any imported good in order to implement a policy of protecting a domestic product. Three, we say that that decision to apply for a suspension of the CT rate should be allowed a broad margin by this court, especially where the application was brought under Article 83, sub 3, sub 3, D, F, and G, which are matters residing in the exclusive knowledge of the 
applying member state. Four, we say the duty to consult with affected importers prior to applying for suspension of the CT rate only requires consultation as far as is reasonable and requires information to be obtained regarding the potential impact of the proposed suspension. And, and five, we say that the court's jurisdiction is limited to the RTC and secondary legislation emanating from the treaty. It cannot, as I've hinted to before, adjudicate violations of other international treaties. So that it is our submission that the evidence in this case does not rise a threshold which will require the court to interfere with the decisions taken by either the state of Trinidad and Tobago and or Cote. Your Honor, the claimants have suggested primarily that the evidence which the state of Trinidad and Tobago placed before Cote was materially deficient. But if you look at the proposal made by the state, the evidence was actually substantive in nature. That's, this is at page 178 of the record, in that the application to Coted contained information relative to its decline in government revenue and the reasons for it, a statement of the state's position relative to foreign exchange, a policy statement which, by which it said candidly that it wished to deter imports, the impact of the contribution which the local manufacturer, that's us, had on the economy, that of course was provided to us in the consultation which we had with us, Information obtained from TCI relative to the impact the importation of other hydraulic cement was having on our business, that too was obtained in the consultation process. Then there was also an examination of the results of the state's own independent investigation into the totality of imports coming into the jurisdiction, an upfront policy statement that the state wishes to assist the local manufacturer to protect its domestic market share. The consultation which the state undertook and the claimant's failure to meaningfully participate in that, as well as a statement of the impact that the increased duty will have on the, on the claimants. When stripped of their essentials, the claimant's complaint lies in the case at bar in the fact that the state allegedly did not include sufficient information as to the impact the 50% suspension would have on its business. But, Your Honours, the state was not obligated to advocate for the claimants, and the evidence is that it had made every effort to engage the claimants in fair and adequate consultation prior to approaching Kote. That consultative exercise undertaken by the state must respectfully be deemed to be fair and adequate in our submission as it complied with the requirements that were previously stipulated by this court in previous learning and stare decisis must apply. In addition, the claimants were also permitted to meaningfully engage with the state and to provide relevant information, but took a deliberate and strategic decision not to do so. In the Viva Voce evidence of Mr. Ramhe, he says that the company did not participate in the consultative exercise on legal advice. Now, the other option open to him or to his companies would have been to comply and then to complain. But by failing to engage the process, at all, I'm preparing for litigious proceedings. The claimants have, in our, in our respective submission, 
has stopped themselves from advancing an argument regarding the validity of the exercise of the team. At least that's our respectful submission. They also take issue with the information presented, and this touches us, as it regards TCL's financial position. And Mr. Benjamin made some remarks in, in cross on, on this, which seemed to suggest that uh, our position had not deteriorated during the pandemic. Mr. Ramhit posits that 60, paragraph 60 and 61 of his witness statement that the state did not disclose to Kutner that TCL was making increased revenues based on the 2020 consolidated audited report. And that's at 1620, 1621 of the record. But that is a consolidated audited report. It is clear from the excerpt cited by Mr. Ramhit that the performance on which he relies, so far as it, it speaks to the TCL group of companies, does not speak to the Trinidad and Tobago based entity, TCL. Indeed, TCL's separate statement of comprehensive income for 2020, filed in these proceedings on the 16th of April, 2021, which is at 1596 to 1598 of the record, and that is before Mr. Ram has deposed to his witness statement, shows that TCL itself suffered significant losses over the period 2019 to 2020. There is absolutely, therefore, no evidence before this court to contradict this, such that the state's representation if quoted, is incorrect. We said in the proceedings in respect of the application for interim measures that we face ruin and we are in fact tottering. That is the evidence. And we are asking this court to avoid a crisis. We as the second intervening party and to adopt the words of Dr. Bob Schaefer, who is adopting himself, the words of my colleague and friend, Mia Mocky. It is also worth noting at, at this juncture for the record that the claimant's witnesses were often contradictory. To that extent, if this were a domestic court, we would speak about credibility, but I, I leave it at, at a statement that they were contradictory. Mr. Ramhit's own admission in evidence that his company absorbed the losses sustained by the 25% tariff imposed by the state in, in 2020 is to be coupled with Mr. Maloney's admission that the importer, the identity of which, as Ms. Peake said, the claimant's witnesses were not able to agree, imported more cement into Trinidad and Tobago in 2020 than in any other year, speaks to the strength of the claimant's position. They're running a, an import business. That's it. No links to the community. We're in an entirely different position. And the uncontradicted evidence before you is that we are tortured. Whatever impression was sought or to be gleaned from presenting our group or consolidated statements as opposed to our state, TCL Trinidad state. Now, Mr. Ramit chose not to include information as to exact to the exact amounts of those losses which he said that he might have been making. We say quite candidly and open, openly, these are the losses that we are making. This is our position. But they're entitled to do so when there are related companies. No one knows who's important, what. We hear from one witness that this is what is taking place. I say no more on that. We run a different, different show. Counsel for the claimants also cross-examined 
the PS to the Ministry of Trade on the foreign exchange generation by TCL. The fact is, however, that TCL has never hit that we are a significant forex owner for the state. As early as the 9th February 2021, Mr. Rojo deposed to the fact in an affidavit sworn in opposition to the claimant's application for interim measures, that's at 1686 of the record, that we are a significant forex owner for the state. The claimants cannot say that. This is one of the primary reasons that we advocated to the state for protection. We said that we contribute to the domestic economy as opposed to an importer who would earn no foreign exchange revenue. We're not speaking behind their back because that's a model that is open to us to pursue and which we have not as yet explored, but which we might have to. Again, the state's representation to Cotet was accurate in that respect. Your Honor, as it relates to the WTO issue, TCL says that there is no jurisdiction vested with respect in this court to consider and or determine the arguments advanced by the claimants. Whether the state breaches bond rate obligations, whether the notification sent to the WTO without objection is sufficient to permit a new bond rate to take effect, all of that must be determined as a matter of WTO law before the, the VSB. Interestingly, in the interaction between the expert witnesses, Mr. Nicely and Dr. Brown, during the course of the Vavoche evidence, there is revealed a discrepancy in the claimant's argument on this point. The claimant's argument relies exclusively on it being accepted that the state was in breach of its WTO obligations, such that quoted is fundamentally in law by approving an illegal measure. The claimants to Mr. Nicely attempted to present this alleged breach as obvious to the point of being unarguable. Dr. Brown advanced passionately, of course, as his whole style, that there is indeed a credible view to suggest that the state is not in breach of its WTO obligations. In Dr. Brown's estimation, it is reasonably to be argued with a good prospect of success that notification was sufficient to allow for the state to adjust the bond rate upwards once there was no objection by any other GAP member. Now, without a breach being established as indisputable, the claimant's argument must in our respectful contention for on this law. We say that it cannot be for this honorable court to determine whether there was in fact a breach or not, as that is a matter which falls squarely within the purview of DSB. As her honor, Madam Justice, Raj, her honor, Raj, Justice Rajnod, we insightfully insight noted. If this honorable court were to attempt to make a pronouncement on the issue, and a similar issue came before the DSP, this court would be running the risk of delivering a decision which may run contrary to a subsequent DSP decision. That would, of course, undermine legal certainty as it relates to trade obligations of CARICOM member states. And it would do so in the context where it is safe to, to, to conclude that we would no longer be in existence. As this court has continu continuously notes, noted, the difficulty which arises with this court offering an opinion on this issue is that the actual GAT WTO members have not expressed a position on the notification one way or the other. 
and that the situation therefore remains fluid. It's therefore entirely possible that the court could be asked to determine an issue which the actual parties to the treaty either A, have no issue with, B, may wish to resolve bilaterally, in which case the issue that arises is that the court would be anticipating and perhaps enlarging on rights which might never, which do not exist, or which might never exist. Now, as it regards policy speeds, this honorable court has already noted that in previously, that a member state is entitled to adopt a domestic economic policy, which promotes local production over extra regional importation. And this is not a close case on that. This is a case where you have an established producer of a product well entrenched in the Caribbean, well integrated into the economies and the social fabric of several, not, not even one country in the region, evident by the number of persons intervening in this matter and those who are those who hold are watching this. And you have on the other side uh, a claimant with very little integration of the type that we have in this business in the in the region. So that the policy if the policy of a member state to adopt a domestic economic policy which promotes local production over extra regional importation is not to be frustrated. Then, without more, the, the answer as to where we, which side we ought to come down on is, is not difficult. And I'm sorry to be speaking in these blunt terms. But the, the court must be seen to encourage parties to abide by the decisions of previous, the previous decisions of this court, even if those decisions are not favorable to them. This is not with respect to domestic courts, and respect for member states dealing with other member states must be encouraged. That is to say, where member state presents information regarding its policy its economic position to its colleagues in confines of quoted, so to speak, as part of a regional community, then that information should be presumed to be presented in good faith unless clear and compelling and cogent evidence can be shown to demonstrate otherwise. Mm -hmm. There is no such evidence we see in in this case, so that your honors, I see that for the reasons if you just allow me to, to, to make a few points to establish community policy. Policy is to I just wanted to say, Mr. Jeremy, that you are reaching the limit of, of your half hour. So if you can finalize your remarks, that would be good. Okay. Just wish to make a few observations. That there's no basis to impugn the, the facts put before quoted by Trian Tobago. Ramhit accepts that prices remain the same despite his 35% tariff and uh, the absence of protection to TCL. There's no evidence that TCL had any advance notice of the state's decision. It is mere speculation on the payment's part. And the community policy, established community policy is to provide protection to regional manufacturers, which satisfy the, the demand.
Your Honor, applying the above principles, I think that the following facts can be found with respect. The state was entitled to apply for a 50% suspension of the CET on cement. That's one. Two, Cotet was entitled to approve the 50% suspension of the CET on cement. And as the application was brought under Article 3, 3B, E, F, and G of the RTC, this Honorable Court ought to allow a, a wide discretion to the state and Cotet unless the decisions of the state on the one hand to apply for the suspension and or quoted to approve the application are so manifestly wrong that they call for judicial intervention. And we say that the evidence in this case falls way below that. Those are the submissions for the second interview. I'm happy to take questions. I'm not Sorry, I was muted. I don't have questions, but maybe my colleagues have. Um, I don't think so. So thank you very much for your submissions. Um, I think we're now... I think, Mr. Jeremy, you're kind of frozen now, but um, anyway, yeah, you're here. Do you, are you hearing me? I was not just now, and your the sound is temperamental now. Are you okay. hearing? Yeah, so I was saying we do not have questions. Um, so what we will do, we have um, uh, a break now. Um, till, I, I suggest till 4.30, and then Mr. Benjamin, you have absolutely not more than half an hour to react in the reply. Um, we are late. Uh, a lot has been said, but you have taken a lot of time in your first round too. So um, it mu you must be able to succinctly get into uh, the arguments that you have heard. So we have not more than half an hour, so I want you to be uh, aware of that. Uh, we will uh, adjourn till 4.30 and then uh, there will only be the reply by Mr. Benjamin and then we close off. Thank you, Anna.
Well, thank you so much. I intend to get home by 5 p.m., as in Good. I shall finish by then. <laughs> um, firstly, as far as my little friend for the state of Trinidad and Tobago is concerned, um, I, she engaged in a conversation with Mr. Justice Jamada, where in the course of that exchange, he put two alternatives to her. Our respectful submission and respect of those alternatives is this. The, the learned judge asked whether um, Dr. Brown's position was A, automatic, or B, was in her language uh, such that once it was notified, you could then take steps to implement. We say, and we invite the court to so find after reviewing her evidence, that the second interpretation is entirely consistent with our earlier submissions. In other words, we do not accept, and we, we ask the court not to accept, that nowhere in her evidence was Dr. Brown saying that any um, notification step was automatic. Um, secondly, um, counsel for uh, the state of Trinidad and Tobago expressed a view as to the limits on the capabilities of the ministers of Coted to come to a conclusion or to express an opinion on a WTO matter. But the evidence of Mr. Nicely, as well as Dr. Brown, was that this was a sort of thing, in particular Dr. Brown, that ministers of the CSME are called upon to do on a regular basis. And we respectfully say that if they are called upon to make a decision, having had the material presented to them, A, B, having had the assistance of the distinguished um, counsel to CARICOM, Dr. Kalita Brown, or someone of her ilk, that they would have no difficulty in resolving any issues uh, that may arise. And that the flexibility or the transactional nature of them coming to a conclusion would not inhibit them in any way. In any event, we submit further that to seek to exclude from Cotet's consideration issues because they have a policy content or because there is a degree of flexibility or ambiguity about them would similarly exclude upon the state's submissions some of the considerations that are, arise under Article 83. Turning to Article 83, we respectfully submit that the answer to the state submissions as to its true construction is to take all of the language into account. And we make three points. Firstly, that Article 83 should be read in the context of the entirety of Part um, 5 of that part of the revised Treaty of Chagabamas, beginning in particular with Article 78, which to paraphrase um, the words of um, Mr. Courtney, Senior Counsel, it is in Article 78 that the right to import is to be found or resides as far as it being made available to a CARICOM national is concerned. But in particular, I would invite the court's attention, secondly, to two specific provisions, which we say have not been given sufficient attention. The first of those, apart from Article 78, is Article 84. And can, can I just read this to you? It is dealt with or referred to in the written submissions of both the state and the claimants. Article 80 deals with coordination of external trade policy. And Article 80, sub Article 4, says, and I quote, where trade agreements involving tariff concessions are being negotiated, the prior approval of Cotted shall be required. And I'm quite confident that the court recalls that um, counsel Dr. Bob Schaefer for CARICOM made some observations in relation to this. So we say that on its own language, the reference to tariff concessions in, that, in this context is obviously a term of art and the most prominent and obvious source of tariff concessions on the international plane concerns the GATT agreements and the WTO arrangements. So that's point number one. And we say that is derived from the language of the treaty. Secondly, no one needs to go around hunting for the, for the words bound rate. Uh, that is not necessary. It is quite clear um, to any international trade lawyer, we would respectfully submit that tariff concessions um, concerns uh, tariff rates and tariff bindings. Thirdly, can I invite attention?
to Article 83.5. Sorry, I, 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 let me let me let me say that again. So I apologize. I have the old version of the um of the of the treaty in front of me. Just might I just have a second? Are your honors hearing me? Yes, we are hearing you. There was a slot, there was a small blip on my end. So I wasn't going to invite your attention to Article 83.5. Just to make a very simple point, may I read it first? Sure. An, application, an application to suspend the applicable common external tariff on an item must be supported by information as prescribed by Cotted from time to time. So that, that gives Cotted a specific role, a specific obligation to examine the evidence and the information put before it. And I invite you to read it up to construe Article 83.5 in the context of the chapeau of Article 83, which also respectfully has not received sufficient attention. May I read that to you as well? In its consideration of an application to suspend the common external tariff on an item, quoted shall, comma, where applicable, take into account whether. So what we say respectfully is that it is clear that Cotet has, if I can put it this way, a positive duty to perform. And I want to just connect this, if I may, to an exchange that I think took place between Justice Jamada and Dr. Brown, Dr. Chap, Chap, <laughs> Dr. Bab Schaefer <laughs> on behalf of CARICOM, where the, uh, the exchange, as I understood it, according to my note, um, ask the question as to what ought to be or what is properly the content of a report. But before one gets there, we say that the language of the chapeau imposes upon Cotted a positive um, obligation where applicable to determine for itself the applicability or the relevance of any ground that is sought to be advanced by a member state. Or if I can put it another way, in the language of this court's jurisprudence, Cotted is obliged not to act as a rubber stamp. It must positively consider and positively ascertain for itself which of the applicable grounds um, uh, are in play. Can I turn to my next point? And I'm still answering, in general terms, the submissions of um, the Council for the uh, Council for Trinidad and Tobago. Can I say that in answer to the issue as to the possible conflict or incongruence between different policy prescriptions? I believe that this first came from the president, and then I believe as well Justice Anderson also asked questions about it. In other words. How does one fit together or sit together the question of an elevation of the duty with its adverse impact upon the claimants, especially in light of what happened in the previous year on the one hand, against the ambition or aspiration of the state to elevate revenue, and at the same time, uh, consider the state's almost simultaneous imposition of a quota, which would definitely go in the opposite direction. We say that the correct reconciliation of those two different and conflicting uh, steps on the part of the state is resolved by the application of the doctrine of good faith. In other words, once that happens, the court is called upon, Cotton is called upon, first of all, and ultimately the court, to assess um, those actions against the template of good faith in accordance with the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and Article 31 in particular, and other principles of um, in public international law. And then second to last in relation to um, counsel for the state of Trinidad and Tobago, my learned friend made an observation after the break about the intervention of Justice Jamada in relation to the question 
as to whether the permanent secretary on the evidence was aware or accepted that the bond rate was 5%. I, I make no comment on any characterization of the intervention. We say three things. We say, first of all, that the, that the weight that this court should apply to that evidence ought to have regard to the fact that there was documentary evidence, there is documentary evidence before the court. That's MN1. That's point number one. Point number two is that it, was, it is always appropriate for a judge seeking clarification, wanting to know the answer, to ask a question, and it was perfectly proper and appropriate for the permanent secretary to answer in the way that she did. Point number three, insofar as my little friend says, and I quote, it is not clear or suggested that the evidence was not clear, it was open to her to re-examine and she chose not to do so. So I commend those three factors to the court as to how they assess the evidence of the permanent secretary. Can I turn now with respect to other matters raised by counsel for CARICOM. Um, I, I don't wish to say anything further in relation to um, anything that the little friend, Mrs. Speak, has said. Uh, um, sorry, with one exception. She made observations about, quote unquote, the reliability of the evidence um, of the first and second claimants witnesses. And we say that the overwhelming documentary evidence coming from the state of Trinidad and Tobago is quite clear as to the volumes of cement that was imported over the period 2016 to 2020. And unequivocally, in answer to the question put to Mr. Ramit as to his absorption of the 35% duty and its consequence uh, in, in terms of a level of protection for the manufacturer TCL, we say that it is the losses that were suffered by and incurred by those claimants, uh, that is where the quote-unquote source of protection came from for consumers who were protected from an increase in the price of cement. And we invite the court to interpret and to accept and have regard to his evidence in that way. I said a moment ago I would turn to Dr. Um, Bob Schaefer and I will do that now. Can, can I say respectfully that, that our arguments as to the applicability and relevance of WTO considerations uh, do not depend upon an argument as to incorporation as such. In other words, we entirely agree with the references to Article 116, for instance, and Article 148. What we say is that Article 83, properly construed in light of Article 84 by itself, but in light of the practice of Coted, not just in relation to other instances, but we have put before the court other occasions concerning Haiti as, and other CARICOM countries where the reference to WTO obligations in general and the bound rate in particular arose. And we say that in any event, on the facts of this case, it was a pertinent um, consideration that Cortez did have regard to, and therefore it is appropriate for this court um, to express its opinion on its applicab applicability and relevance. Secondly, can I invite attention um, to paragraph 20 of Dr. Bob Schaefer's speaking note. I don't know if you have it there, but may I just remind you, that is where my learned friend and colleague referred to the Portuguese case and identified that EU law has two relevant exceptions. <clears throat> um, the second that we say is not applicable <clears throat> is where there is an express reference to the precise provisions of the WTO agreements, but the aspect of the exception which we say is applicable is where it is intended by means of the relevant measure to implement a particular obligation. And that is what we rely upon. So we say that the Portuguese case 
And my little friend's citation at paragraph 20, the first part of it is in support of the claimant's case. Finally, towards the end of her contribution, the um, Council for CARICOM had an exchange, I believe, with Justice Anderson. And as I understood um, their exchange, it went along these lines. The court through Justice Anderson was concerned to ascertain what would be the appropriate level of intrusion, if I can borrow his words. And, and what we say with respect is that the appropriate level of scrutiny, the appropriate level of scrutiny in substitution for the word intrusion is one which does the following. A is faithful to a common sense interpretation of Article 83. B does not hollow out the full extent and meaning of Article 26 and the court's jurisprudence. C, or thirdly, is respective of and reflective of the rule of law, but fourthly, does not go so far as to go from an amber light to a red light and substitute the court's, or in fact, court, yes, the court's decision for that of the decision maker. In other words, it is a degree of scrutiny that is appropriately restrained, constrained, but not abdicatory. In other words, at no point in time should this court succumb to those submissions that suggest that it has no role to play whatsoever. I think that I've already said what I want to say uh, um, as to the exchange between Justice Jamada and Article 83.5. I'm just looking at my notes um, as to the exchange that took place in relation to um, the Cotter decision of the 50, uh, the 51st decision on the 26th and 27th of November. So, finally, now, can I turn to, in the many minutes, to Belize and TCL? My single comment in relation to um, Belize is to reinforce Mr. Courtney's observation, which I think I mentioned a moment ago at paragraph 14 of his note, and I should read it because it supports the claimant's case. It is submitted that Article 78 of the RTC, properly construed, does create a right to import goods from outside the community. He goes on to say, in any event, it must be interpreted and applied with other provisions of the RTC, including Article 83, which affords the first defendant the right to apply to suspend the CET and to impose a higher tariff. Can I say with respect that we agree but we go further, we go further and we say, we invite the court to have very much in mind Article 6D, which makes express provision for trade with third parties. So that to the extent that you have heard extensive submissions from all of the parties that seek to create the unbalanced impression that the objectives of the RTC are exclusively limited to the promotion of regional production, we say that those interpretations and submissions are not consistent with the actual language of the objectives of the RTC, in particular, Article 6D. Finally, can I make a closing comment in relation to the submissions advanced 
and my learned friend, Mr. Jeremy, for TCL. It sure. would not have... If, before you go there, I thought that Ms. Matut raised her hand. I, I, I apologize. I, I wasn't looking at uh, Ms. Matut. Ms. Matut, I apologize. Can I no, no, help? No problem. Is there anything, Ms. Matut? Yes, please, Your Honors. Thank you for allowing me to intervene at this stage. I just wanted to make a clarification in relation to the submission in which my learned senior is relying on at our paragraph 14 of the speaking note. And it's only to indicate that um, it should read that when Article 78 is properly construed, it does not create a right to import goods from outside the community. So I just wanted to make that clarification to the court. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm very grateful for my, for my little friend, and maybe that I have to revise my <laughs> reliance on a submission, which I, I was pleasantly surprised when I heard it. I looked at the note, at the speaking note, I underlined every word, um, and therefore, if my friend is withdrawing it, as she is entitled so to do, can I simply commend to the court the actual wording of Article 78, which is the goal of the community trade policy shall be the sustained growth of intra-community and international trade and mutually beneficial exchange of goods and services among member states and between, members, between the community and third states. So that permits me to say that the notion that this court has to make a choice between supporting regional production in the region on the one hand and supporting cement production in Turkey, as was suggested by council for CARICOM, is with the greatest of respect, A, a false choice, and B, it is simply not the claimant's case. I was being saddled with a proposition that I did not seek to advance and with great respect and I dare say professional regard to my learned friend, Dr. Bob Schaefer, I rejected. I was going to say something about weight um, in relation to TCL because it would not have escaped this court's notice that TCL opted to put forward no, and I repeat, no evidence. And therefore, none of the statements to be found in the mouth of um, their general manager or managing director, I'm very wary of mispronouncing his name, so I will not do so. None of that evidence was tested, and this is at trial. And therefore, we say respectfully that insofar as my learned friend advances submissions on untested, uncross-examined um, evidence, we invite the court to place absolutely zero weight on that evidence and to uh, attach equal weight, i.e. none, to his submissions to the extent that they are derived from untested, unchallenged, unexplored, and therefore with respect, unreliable evidence. It is now 4.54. Unless the court has questions for me, I propose to stop speaking. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't see any signal that um, there are any further questions. Um, probably there are questions, but um, there is a time for everything. So I think we um, we already had uh, enough exchanges and, and questions. Um, um, it's now for the court to um, consider everything that is before it. Uh, we will give a decision as quickly as we can, but um, of course I make the point this is not uh, an everyday case. This uh, requires uh, study, deliberations, etc. Um, and also I have to remark that um, there will be a recess of the court in, in August, September. So I do not dare to say when exactly the decision will be here. We will try to to be as fast as we can, but of course we also need to be very uh, careful in drafting any decision. So, given those uh, facts, I, I I thank council for all their contributions.
it was a long two days, but a lot has been said, a lot about, a lot to think about. Um, the court will adjourn, and uh, as soon as it is ready to deliver a judgment, uh, you will be notified, and we will then deliver that judgment. So, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Anas. I call now upon the Deputy Registrar to adjourn the case. Sincerest thank you to our bench for the last two days, Mr. Justice Witt to Mr. Justice Anderson, Madam Justice Rajna Lee, Mr. Justice Barrow, and to Mr. Justice Jawada. Council, it has been our pleasure to have you with us over the last two days. Thank you for being here. Special thank you to the staff of the Caribbean Court of Justice for all your efforts before and over the last two days. This court now stands adjourned. All safety to you and yours. Good afternoon to all. Thank you.